Okay, this is an annotated version of a conversation debate I had with Aaron Mate on another podcast I do. I recommend the YouTube version where I've tried to include references and links to all the facts and sources that Aaron and I argue about so people can do their own research. Let me know if you think I've been fair. Aaron is a journalist for The Gray Zone, which I think is uh, properly described as a left-wing website, well-known for its anti-Israel positions. He tweets against Israel so constantly, I joke that his followers must have been worried about him for the three hours he was missing. Recently, when Roger Waters in his Glenn Greenwald interview speculated that the Hamas atrocities might be a false flag operation, he mentioned that he was informed by something he'd seen on the gray zone. To be fair, I don't know what he was referring to, but Greenwald, for his part, didn't seem surprised. Mate has also been of late closely associated with Norman Finkelstein, who I recently also hosted on our podcast. So I'm going to say a few words. I have a few bullet points here uh, that pertain to both of them. First of all, I've gotten some very pointed private criticism from influential people who I feel should, who feel I should not be speaking to the likes of Mate and Finkelstein. And how can I give airtime to a guy who on October 7th called the Hamas attack heroic and said, the heroic resistance in Gaza, it warms every fiber of my soul. The scenes of Gaza's smiling children as their arrogant Jewish supremacist oppressors have finally been humbled. So uh, I get it. That's, that's tough. To, uh, that's tough talk to handle with a guy who, who's, whose soul is filled with happiness um, upon first report of these atrocities. So why and how can I talk to a guy like that? Well, first of all, I, I, there's something about me. I want to talk to people like that. If I'm going to debate this, I want to debate the best, best known, most effective advocates of the other side. I don't want to be like one of those shows that bring on that brings on a lackey or a second-rate guy, second-rate advocate. And also, but also, I actually believe all the nonsense about free speech. I actually believe, as Justice Brandeis said, that in frank expression of conflicting ideas lies the greatest promise of wisdom. And maybe I'm missing something, but also it's infuriating to me that for so many years people have been mocking the heckler's veto of, for instance, students on campuses that wouldn't let people like Charles Murray or even far less controversial speakers simply speak. The people who mocked that thing are now discouraging open conversations with people like Norman Finkelstein. Is it really possible that free speech is our most cherished value except when shit gets real? That sounds awfully woke to me. I think it's essential that the views of Mate and Finkelstein are challenged and challenged on a daily basis. Every serious TV network ought to be devoting some time to head-on debates of this issue. When I was a kid, there were like five TV channels and everyone read from the same newspapers. They really, really had no choice. And this was no doubt a moderating influence on society. It moderated politics because everybody was well acquainted with the views of the other side. Now we have these ideological algorithmic bubbles where millions of people never once even hear contradictory facts or arguments. So of course, extremism mushrooms. And from within those bubbles and the limited facts and arguments available, why would these people, how would these people even know that their views are extreme? They have nothing even to compare them to. So I decided if I want my point of view to be heard by the followers of Mate and Finkelstein, millions and millions of people all over the world, I need to talk to Mate and Finkelstein. I'll also admit, I have to be honest, I don't hate these guys. I can't account for why, because yes, the logical conclusion of at least some of the things they say, to my view, is just unacceptable. But I think there's a certain Vaseline you have to put over the lens when you deal with people who disagree with you. Otherwise, first of all, you can't debate them. And the whole notion of a democratic society that allows for various degrees, multiculturalism, multi-ethnic, all of it. It can't work 
if we can't talk to each other. So I rather like the Vaseline over my eyes, and I was raised that way. Um, after the conversation I had with Finkelstein, we enjoyed a nice meal together, and I enjoyed hearing him tear to shreds Barack Obama, Robin, Robin D'Angelo, uh, Ibram Kendi. If I didn't know Finkelstein's view on Israel, I would think he was some kind of genius. I'd be hanging out with him every day. So that's the way I feel about it. Mate and Finkelstein at least deal in sourced facts, facts that they will present me, facts that I can challenge, facts that I can look up, and if they won't acknowledge that my version or my interpretation of the facts cor is correct, at least in front of a viewer, I can make the points, as opposed to like a Rashid Khalidi, who I found actually to be totally dishonest. Anyway, on the subject of facts, <clears throat> I want to say something that I was thinking about. This is 2023, and I think we all have to acknowledge that digital words don't cost money, and they don't take up more space. They don't create bigger books, and some of the norms of scholarship ought to change. Until recently, a lot of scholarship was cut and paste. You extract some bit of a quote from something that someone was said. You put ellipses around it. And then you put a footnote to the name of a book and a, and a page in the book. And of course, almost nobody has access to the books. Nobody wants to spend the money. And that becomes an argument. I think that is totally unacceptable in 2023. I think that every single footnote in a modern presentation ought to include a generous portion of the original context. There's no copyright issue. Fair use, as I understand it, fully allows for it. And if it's a printed book, the book should have a link, a website, where these extended footnotes are presented. I think this deceptive quote thing with ellipses should be extinguished. It should become extinct. A book should no longer be considered adequate. A scholarly book should no longer be considered scholarly if it doesn't include a few paragraphs before and a few paragraphs after any quote or any fact it wants to use. So let me give you an example from Finkelstein's book on Gaza. But he does this, in my opinion, all the time. I have many, many examples that I've collected. Mate does it too, but I confront him with it in the debate. Finkelstein, in his book on Gaza, presents evidence from a group called, a group of a former IDF soldiers called Breaking the Silence, who testified uh, about abuses uh, that they saw in their experience in the IDF. So here's the quote. Finkelstein writes, indeed, one soldier after another after another testified that Israel deployed, quote, insane amounts of firepower during the invasion. Quote, we are hitting innocence and our, artil and our artillery fire there was insane. Quote, firepower was insane. But from the very same paragraphs of that testimony, here's the kind of thing that Finkelstein leaves out. Quote, so I see I'm firing literally into a built-up area. I don't know to what degree it is still inhabited because the army made considerable attempts to get people to leave. Finkelstein leaves that out. Continues. When the battalion commander spoke, his personal message was that he was not willing for any of us to get hurt or risk himself because of suspects. And if there's a need, we take down anyone, if there's a need. He would do everything in his power so that none of the soldiers would get hurt. This was the general attitude in the army. Go in with insane firepower because this is our only advantage over them. Another quote. Still, where I was in this respect, the tone was not overzealous. This is the same guy who said the stuff that Finkelstein quotes. Our tone was not overzealous. Even if the soldier wanted to shoot, he didn't. Finally, quote, we are hitting innocents and our, and our artillery fire there was insane. But on the other hand, you hear shooting out of Gaza and you return fire immediately. So you can, you can feel however you want about that. But I don't think a reasonable person could disagree that the context is slightly different or maybe significantly different 
from the impression that Finkelstein communicates. This is in comparison to the historian I most admire, Benny Morris, whose every book contains a treasure trove of facts that can be used by either side of the debate. And this is because Morris is obsessed with the full, unvarnished truth and full disclosure, in my opinion. I've read or skimmed like five Finkelstein books, and I don't think I found a single negative fact about Arab behavior. Is it really possible that in a 100-year conflict, only one side has contributed to the conflict? Only one side has ever done anything wrong? Re-listening to my conversation with Mate, I made a few notes. Let me share them with you, finally. The one thing Mate and I both agree on, and Finkelstein actually seemed to have agreed to this, or at least he didn't dispute it, is that civilian casualties are part of the Hamas plan. I said to Mate, this is the only war that I'm aware of in human history where one side wants its own civilians to die more than the enemy they're fighting. Can you imagine fighting a war where the death of its own civilians is one of the enemy's prime objectives? In our conversation about the 1948 war, the War of Independence or the Nakba, I strongly disputed Aaron's claim of ethnic cleansing. But the point I failed to make is that the opposite is actually, in my opinion, more true. The Arab attack on the Jews to throw them into the sea as Morris quotes, much more neatly fits the label of ethnic cleansing and even genocide. This was the bloodiest war in Israel's history. One out of 100 Israeli Jews died in that war. And one can only imagine what that percentage, what that 1% percentage would have been if Israel had been weaker and not been able to win that war. We had a dispute about ethnostates and Arab rights in Israel I was afraid to misspeak, but I, Arab, this is the rights of Arab citizens of Israel. I was afraid to misspeak, but I did some um, research on it and I double checked. As far as I understand it, Arabs have all the same political rights in Israel that Jews do. All the same political rights in Israel that Jews do, except they are not required to serve in the military. They may volunteer. For obvious reasons, uh, they don't. Further, only Jews around the world have the automatic right to become citizens of Israel under the right of return. Also re-listening to this conversation and, and really many conversations I've had, it always comes to me how bad we are as humans at putting ourselves in the shoes of the people we disagree with. Like you take a comical example like the way New York City is now freaking out about all the migrants pouring in after years of calling anybody from any other location making the same complaint racists. That's all we ever did was call them racists until it happened to us, and all of a sudden, we're like, oh, well, I guess it's more complicated than that. So similarly, and much worse, people are often quite casual about asking people to take chances with the lives of their own families and their own children. So for instance, Finkelstein once mocked, it's in this debate with Mate, Finkelstein once mocked Israelis for worrying, or even, he Im implies, pretending to worry about the Hamas tunnels, stating flatly, there's no evidence whatsoever that Hamas's tunnels are used for terror. There are other times where Finkelstein claimed that the Hamas rockets were merely fireworks and could do no real damage to the Israelis, and that the Iron Dome was not only unnecessary, but that it was actually a fraud that Israel knows the Iron Dome doesn't work, and Hamas knows that its rockets don't work, and Israel knows that Hamas's rockets don't work, and there's a kind of conspiracy between both sides to play out this charade for some reason that I'm not, I, I don't understand how Finkelstein's logic concludes. But imagine if Israel had taken Finkelstein's advice and not concerned itself with the tunnels and not had the Iron Dome. Finally, there's a habit of lack of disclosure that Mate uh, uh, routinely does, which I find infuriating. So for instance, he found some obscure statement that the president, not the Ayatollah, not the leader of Iran, the president who's since been fired, signed on to in an organization of Arab states that would imply that Iran would be okay with a Palestinian state on the 67 borders. 
It says nothing about how the right of return would be handled. It says nothing about recognizing Israel. But yes, there is that signature. But he ignores countless calls by the actual leader of Iran to eradicate the Zionist entity. I put one of the tweets in the uh, upcoming debate. And he has this pattern over and over of finding some quote or even a part of a quote which makes the point he wants and totally ignoring any number of quotes by the same person to the contrary. For instance, the Arab-Israeli peace talks, Palestinian-Israeli peace talks of 2000 and 2007, Mate will dismiss the multiple detailed accounts by every single first-hand source I throw at him. Anyone who tells him what he doesn't want to hear is unreliable. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I was also going to mention the Goldstone Report and the way it was walked back, but you can do that research on your own if you're really interested in it. Okay, as always, email me at podcast at comedycell.com. Aaron Mate, hit it! Hello, welcome to Live from America podcast. This is Hatem, alongside me, the one and only, Noel Dorman. Hello. Good to see you, sir. <clears throat> Second podcast in a row for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good to see you. And our guest is Aaron Mate, journalist and the uh, host of uh, Pushback podcast with Aaron Mate. Yes, good to be here. I'm also the co-host of, a, of Useful Idiots with my friend Katie Halper. Yes. Great to see you guys. Good to be here. Thank you for coming. You've been uh, our guest for a couple of times, and uh, I'm glad to have you now. Uh, we can discuss it. A lot to discuss. First, your, vo- your video with the uh, congressman. Senator Coons, yes. That did, was. Did, a, did, you, did you plan it? Tell us the truth. Did you plan it? I did not plan that. Yeah? No. no. You just happened to sit across from him? That was Did fake. you see that video, No. I didn't see the video, but I read about the... the... Yeah. So what happened? It was fake. It was fate. Um, I was taking a train on Monday to D.C. And um, I didn't want to sit at that table, you know, on the Acela. You have to sometimes sit four people to a table. I didn't want to sit there because I wanted to get some work done and not have to, I don't know, be around people. So I went to the cafe car, tried to work there, but it was too shaky. So I came back to my seat, put my laptop down and sat down. And right in front of me is Senator Chris Coons. Mm. And uh, I felt compelled to question him about his stance on the war on Gaza because he does not support a ceasefire. So I in the up. quiet car. How in the quiet, you? it was in the quiet car. Yes, how dare was. you? But in my defense, I did speak in a quiet tone. <laughs> now that's an atrocity. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? At least we can all agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I saw the video, but did you actually get anything out of him? No. Well, at first he didn't want to answer. At first he refused to answer, and he asked me a bunch of questions. He asked me, you know, what my name is, what I do. He asked me how I got that seat. I explained that I bought the seat. Uh, he threatened to have me thrown off the train for questioning him, which I thought was funny because he does he's a senator, but he's not a train conductor. Mm. But finally he answered my question and he he just said that he, you know, supports Israel's right to defend itself and that they suffered this atrocity on, on October seventh. And uh, you know, I challenged him on some of the things he said and finally he got up and left. And then he came back and by at that point a conductor had come because he had asked for help for assistance because he didn't want to answer my questions. And uh, the conductor said that either you take a different seat or we throw you off the train. So I complied, gathered my belongings in silence. By that point, I tweet I'd filmed the video of our exchange, and so I tweeted it out. It started going viral, and uh, about half an hour or so later, he walked by me. He saw me. I didn't say anything because I was respecting the fact that he had said that he wanted me to stop talking to him, and we're still in the quiet car. And I think that triggered him, just him seeing me, and. Next thing I knew, we stopped in Philadelphia, and uh, some police officers came up to me and said, can you come with us? So they took me off the train and said I'd been removed at the request of the conductor, but I would bet anything that that was at the behest of the senator, who was not happy to see me still in now, the car. Now, when you saw the police, we got to get to the other stuff, but when you, when you saw the police officers, you're like, awesome, right? Like, this, this is, this <laughs> no. is really, I, don't, I wouldn't blame you, like, this is going to turn into a... <laughs> like, I actually didn't think that. I, you know, I, the video itself, uh, I was... Happy to get that out, but uh, I did not want to be dealing with police. No, I, All right. so, no. so my, 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 I, I kind of defended you on that. Uh, I said, look, this is journalism. Journalism has a special place in our society. A lot of uh, uh, journalism is done by tenacious reporters, you know, throwing questions at people. And uh, as they say, one man's obnoxious journalist is another man's freedom fighter. So <laughs> that's... Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, so I'm like, that. you know, I mean, I, there are... There are, I, there are I, I, somebody said, well, you, you'd support... Him. I wasn't there... I, if I had seen it, I might have said, I could imagine saying, oh, that's enough. You know, you, you've, you've gone over the line. But the fact that a journalist, I mean, these guys 
live their lives by trying to avoid journalists, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to grab them when you can. Yeah. So you grab, he's a senator for Christ's sake. This is, you know, yeah. it's not the end of the world. Yeah. So I, I uh, you know, I, but I don't blame you. All right. So look, let me speak, uh, uh, you know, a little person. I'm very weighed down by all this. Um, the, I almost didn't want to do it because to have this debate at the time when there's such suffering going on, mm -hmm. Um, is a is a is a weird optic, mm. uh, and and people of bad faith, and I've seen it already, will turn every argument into the fact that you don't care, blah blah blah, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know, and and I know that's what I'm getting into, and I and I really don't look forward to it. And by the way, just so you know that what and you know this, but what my credentials are. I didn't make that argument, although I do question the motives of people who, um, some of the people who were, you know, wanting to correct everybody who talked about the number of babies who were de supposedly decapitated. Mm -hmm. As you know, I also respected it. Say, listen, if 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 it's being reported by a newspaper, then it's got to be accurate, and it's it's perfectly reasonable for somebody to expect it to be accurate or and expect somebody to correct it. If it's not accurate, yeah, and and while it's true that some of the people who are very gung ho about that were certainly embracing that as a way to deflect the story into something else, I think we ha we we have to suck that up. So you know, I I only to say that I I when people make arguments, I I tend to try not to attack them personally for it. But I know that's I know I'm heading into a minefield here. But anyway, so look, let me. And I thought about how to start it in, in a more uh, general way. And that's why I didn't want it to be a debate because, um, like I said, there's a, there's a lot of lot of suffering going on. And and I just let me say one other thing, just to set it up. You know, he and I have a common friend. Uh, I was just telling him about him. who's Palestinian, and. Um, and always in the past, he and I, for years, I mean, like 20, 30 years, arguing about Israel and Palestine, going back with my father. And it got a little hot, you know. But uh, you, you uh, always as kind of friends and, and like real friends, right? Yeah. And I believe he's watching right now. Uh, so, <clears throat> but on this issue, it, we, we couldn't really talk about it. And this is before the uh, reprisal started. And... Um, so he started sending me. Can I? I don't know if I can say. He started sending me a lot of uh, pictures of of dead children, and I said, and I got upset. I said, "Why are you sending me? I don't send you the pictures of the dead Israelis, you know." And I felt like this was, you know, not an argument. It was just kind of a, you know, it's like, what, what am I supposed to say? You think you think I'm 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 soft on children dying? I I have children. I I can't even imagine that kind of thing, that kind of suffering. Uh, and, um, but anyway, so then he, we were, what's happening, you know, it didn't work. So then he, he, he left me a, he, he recorded a message to me, you know. And as he started to record the message, he just began to sob. Just, just un uncontrollably, you know. And I got it because it doesn't really matter um, what you think about it. You could even think I'll, I'll take it from the Palestinian point of view, but it could be the point of view. You could even think, this is Hamas's fault. I understand it. You, know, you, you could think all kinds of things, but it's still unbearable. It's still unbearable to see this kind of thing, and you still expect it and want it to stop uh, because the visceral is so powerful. And, um, of course, this is the way every war has ever fought has looked and probably not nearly as bad as most of the wars that we've considered to be justified have looked. Um, but those happened invisibly in some way. So we're dealing with something, and maybe in the long term, this technology will bring war home to us in such a way that there'll be less war, maybe. Maybe, you know, because now that we, we really understanding it more i don't know maybe that's naive but in any case all of which is to say that it's very difficult to talk about this stuff and uh 
uh, I, I wanted to get that off my chest. Okay. <clears throat> so I, I wrote something down. I haven't looked at it in a couple of days, so I hope it doesn't sound stupid now. But I was trying to think of a, of a more gentle way to... Oh, right, first question. First of all, just so I know. Do you consider, consider yourself a journalist or an advocate? Okay, first of all, before I answer, no, I can see the pain in your face as you talk about this. So I just want to recognize that and I appreciate you having a conversation with me. I didn't come here thinking we were going to debate. We're just talking about a really important issue. We're going to argue and so, uh, for, well, so sure, get into I'm it. Sure we yeah, will, don't but, push it over. <laughs> no, but I, I didn't come here thinking I'd, I'd be deba- I'm happy to debate, but that's not how I see this. I just, yeah. you know, we're, we're just talking. Okay. And I see the pain in your face and, and I appreciate you wanting to facilitate a conversation about it. So thank you. It's a really difficult time. Do I, I see myself as a journalist, and sometimes that involves some advocacy because I'm not going to pretend I don't have opinions. I, I do have a bias. Um, I'm very critical of Israel. I have been my whole life, and I do advocate for Palestinian freedom, and I'm not shy about that. But uh, to me, there's no contradiction with my journalism because journalism speaks for itself. Either I'm factual or I'm not. Well, I was, like I've been reading about the ethics for journalists. So, for instance, the journalists ethically are, are supposed to present facts to the contrary that a reasonable person would want to mm-hmm. know about uh, that happened in a story. Where, like, let's see an example. Look, so if, if you're a salesman for Toyota, you can tell somebody this car does zero to 60 in five seconds. You don't have to tell them, and by the way, that's the lowest in the class. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but if you're a journalist for Consumer Reports, you have to say it does zero to 60, and you have to, and you have to say, but by the way, it's not. A, so that's the difference. The salesman is an advocate. Okay. Yeah. And the journalist is, has, has, he can still focus on stories that he feels need to be heard. But I think at, at a, and by the way, I, I don't think many journalists do what I'm saying, we agreed on exactly what I'm saying during the um, Russiagate stuff. Mm-hmm. This is exactly what I'm describing. It's exactly what they didn't do. 100%. They would yeah. ignore facts, which any reasonable person would have said, oh, well, I, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. You didn't tell me that. Yeah. Any, of course I wanted to know that. So, I, I and, totally and you go- feel on I, this Palestinian issue, you always offer those facts that a person would, would want to know? If you have specific examples of me leaving out important countervailing facts, I'm happy to hear it. But in general, I do, I do. Okay, I, we'll, 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 well get back to in, that in later. In general, I totally endorse the principle that it's ethical for a, it's unethical for a journalist to omit countervailing facts, and I call that out all the time in the work that I do. So I totally, uh, I'm fine to hold myself to the same standard. All right. So, so the notion that one party is completely at fault and one party is completely guilty is like silly enough in a divorce proceeding, right? Like there's 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 always to there's always things to seriously believe such a thing to be true in a hundred year conflict between nations is stupid. It, it can't be one party is all hundred percent right. A hundred party never, other party never did anything wrong. And to take such an opinion without even getting to specifics undermines one credibility, one's credibility as a historian or a journalist. So let me you know, start. Can I stop you there for a second? Yeah. I've never said that Palestinians have done nothing I'm not wrong. Saying, I'm, not okay. saying, I'm not saying it. Uh, yeah. So, so, so let me start by giving you a chance. I wrote this out. Okay. Starting in the late 1800s when Zionism came, uh-huh. <laughs> what part of the Israeli narrative are you sympathetic to and what part of the Arabic story mm-hmm. are you highly critical of? The part of the uh, Zionist narrative that I'm sympathetic to is the desire for a national home. After all that persecution, that's, that's just a desire. That's not. A, that's not an action. Okay. Well, I, I'm. I'm. So, are you asking me? Did, has have the okay, Jews ever the, did anything? The, the intent. The the the. Okay. Fine. Even the action to to seek a national home for a persecuted people. I'm very sympathetic to that. Now I understand why people wanted to create Israel. I just don't accept the self-proclaimed right of Zionists to establish that state at the expense of the indigenous population. So what you, so so in the 1880s, uh-huh. if we were Jews being uh, raped, our wives being raped by the Cossacks, and we said, let's, we can't, this is, this is unbearable, yeah. to use Obama's term, this is unbearable. Let's go join our, um, let's go join the Jews in, in Israel. Mm-hmm. You would have said, that's okay to do. Uh, provided we did not infringe on the rights of no, the local population. No, we're going to go buy, buy land. Yeah, provided we didn't, you know, have you heard of what's his name? Ahad Ayam? I mean, I learned about him growing up. 
He was a Zionist, a cultural Zionist. So he believed in a Jewish national home, but without infringing on the rights of, of the Arabs that are already there. But that's, so not, I that, that's not the caveat. I'm saying we can go and we can buy land. Yeah, okay, sure. If we're buying land and we have the consent of the people who live there, sure. No, yeah. we don't don't need the consent of the people who live there. There's no law that says you need the consent of the people. How do you get how if do you get, going how are you going to get the consent of the people who live there? You don't you can't there's no phones. If you're go well, well then you go there and you base if you're trying to build it's one thing to buy land, but how about to build an actual an, an ethno state for yourself? No, no, step by step. Okay. But it's okay to go buy the land. If sure, if if you have if everyone has property rights and sure, yeah, there's no reason why Jews can't buy land. Sure. All right. Yeah. And and there's no reason they can't expand their existing uh, community. Sure, if they own it and if they've obtained it legally, sure. Yeah. Right. So, so then, for the most part, up till like 1946, you're okay with the Jewish. No, because before then, I mean, this there were no there were no expulsions or anything before 1946. There were there was certainly there was violence and there was a British colonizer that was uh, basically taking the position that we were going to create a Jewish state there without caring about the rights of the local population. Lord Balfour even wrote no, that's, that privately. That's, that's, you can take that up with the British. I'm talking about the— Okay, well, but, but, but the Zionist movement played along with that. And, All right, but— and, and, uh, and, they, and there were terror attacks committed by groups like that were part of the Zionist movement. They were both. Yeah. They were, well, sure. They were yeah. both. But, it was, but, the, but, the, but the point both is— Both ways. In the late 1800s, correct me if I'm wrong, the Jewish population in, in Palestine was about 5%. Maybe less than that? Five or seven. But it was a majority in Jerusalem. Okay. So there was a very small uh, Jewish population, but, but the vast influx— Well, it was a very small outside. population in absolute numbers all the around. The vast majority—can we agree the vast majority were Arabs? Yeah, yeah. But, okay. but it, is, it, is, it is important that it was also very sparsely populated. Okay, sure. Yeah. But, but also you had people like Jabotinsky, the Zionist leader, saying that Zionism is a colonizing adventure. He was honest about that. No, no. You, you have—colonizing is not colonial. Co colonizing— Yes, it is. No, colonial and colonize have two different definitions. Okay, Th this gets into semantics. The the the, well, the point of Jeb concept. The point of Jeb Tinsky was that Zionism was a colonial endeavor because he understood we could colonize. He, he pointed, we could colonize an unpopulated land. Okay, but Jabotinsky and Ben Gurion, who was the you know the founding prime minister of Israel, they understood that there were people there that they were trying to displace, which is exactly what they did. Who would be displaced? Yes, there was there, there was definitely there was definitely talk of that, but but you're you're getting ahead of. I'm trying to take a step. I think it's very it's very um, necessary to take it step by step. I, I support the idea of a national home for Jews, provided everyone is equal. Uh, which was a court. Some Zionists actually believed in that. Not a, it yes, was a tendency. That's, 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 I'm so, happy you say that because so you're, because you're you're picking. There was a lot of different opinions. Yeah, there were one state Noam Zionists. Chom Noam Chomsky believed in that, and he even went and lived in Israel for a bit, trying to be a part of that movement. But he realized quickly that 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 dream was dead at that point. Well, but, neither but, side wanted that. Well, uh, certainly, Palestinian Arabs did not want a, a Jewish state in their midst. Yes, and I, no, I can't, I can't, I can't it, blame Palestinians for not wanting to uh, uh, to be responsible for the crimes of the Nazis. I can't blame them for that. They supported the, 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 Haj, the Husseini supported the Nazis, but that's another. Okay, the, yes, the leader picked by the British did support did, but then he, also he was the leader. Yes, and also American Jew American Jews also kept out uh, uh, Jewish refugees from coming here so they that's, can go to. Uh, that's, I'm not talking about that. Okay, well that's uh, anyway. That's that. This there, there's so many historical issues we can debate, but the premise is, uh, I uh, there were people inside Palestine and they were displaced to make this ethno Jewish state. That's just a fact. That, it, it's not disputed. And, like when I was growing up, I was told that all the Palestinian Arabs fled their homes voluntarily because they wanted the Arabs to wipe out Israel, which is not true. They were ethnically cleansed, and uh, there are there were massacres like in Dar Yassin, and there were there are Palestinians now still have the keys to their ancestral homes, and their rights have never ever been addressed. And I'm not going to deny that fact. I think it's it's that's just basic history. Well, wait, what do you mean? There, there, there were there were. I mean, this is the thing. You, you won't take it step by step. I had something I wanted to read to you here, but I, I can't find it. Um, up until 46, it was okay. I'm, I'm asking you. I'm, I, what I'm getting at is if a people move to a, a, a country legally, mm -hmm. I understand that the people on the other end are unhappy. I understand, for God's sake, that the Harlem, people, black people in Harlem are furious about gentrification, although I don't mean to be glib. But uh, this was obviously worse. But I'm saying that that there is no, especially at that time in history, who would have had the nerve to tell somebody fleeing death mm -hmm. 
you can't go buy land in Palestine. No, no, nobody on planet Earth would have thought that. Well, American Jews told them you can't come here, and they were fine to ship them off to Palestine. Many, many, Ameri- many, many European Jews wanted to come here, mm-hmm. but the Zionist movement actually uh, lobbied to have them sent over to Palestine because they wanted to colonize the land. They they needed people. They needed people to fight, uh, and, and that's what they did. And um, up until 1946, look, the whole reason that that that, that Jews were promised that land is because the British made that pledge. But why should I respect the rule of the British over Palestine? They're not indigenous to, to that land either. Oh, most of it was under the Ottomans, right? Okay, but, and then the British took it over, and that's when they promised a Jewish state inside Palestine. And and the British, after they promised that, and, and you can read about this in, in Rashid Khalidi's book, The Hundred Years' War in Palestine. Oh, I read that. I, I know you had him on recently. They prevented people locally from learning about it. They stopped the printing presses. They didn't want, lo- because locals didn't want to... Uh, Have you looked at the footnotes uh, of Khalidi's book? It's a disgrace. He uh, no no I'm because I, I did some research about this for I've not looked at the footnotes because I because I have he, a lot of respect. He will for him. he will. I, I I was shocked. I was doing I was researching Khalidi's book for the um, issue of uh, the Clinton parameters. Uh huh. And like Benny Morris's book has this book and that book, page numbers, paragraphs. Uh, Khalidi just says. He just has the title of two books. He says, you know, there's not a lot of good books about this. Okay, I, I, I can't like you know. like if he were if he were a professor, if if you handed something into him as a professor, he'd give you an F. Like I I couldn't I literally and anybody please check this. out. I could not believe how. Okay, I will. I check wouldn't even this. call it sourced. I'm gonna bet that I'm not gonna agree with you because yeah. I have a lot of trust in. But but I'm happy to take a you look. Can, you won't disagree about about the about the footnotes about okay. the footnotes. Absolutely, okay. you won't. Do I'll I, bet you a thousand dollars. Do you want to debate the, whether he's right about the Clinton parameters? Well, I, I, I have no way of knowing if he's right because he has no sources. Okay. I I have a question. Yeah. If you if you buy the land, that doesn't mean you change the laws of the area. It doesn't mean you start a army. It doesn't mean a lot of things. Am I right? Yeah. Like, exactly. I, it doesn't mean you have the right to create an ethno state that uh, or a state at all that privileges exactly at that, that point. point. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying about Zionism. It wasn't just a friendly land acquisition. It was a deliberate attempt to create an ethno state where one particular ethnicity. Okay, has- I, this ethno state is, is jargon. They 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 went to create a state. What states weren't ethno states in in those days? The Fr- France was an ethno state. Italy was an ethno state. Yeah, they, okay. they, they went to create a state. Russia was an ethno state. Every state was ethno state. It, it, they went to create. Now, you, say, now, you say ethno state like it was. Some, but now Japan these, is an ethno state. But now Korea is a, sta- let's, let's name what states are not ethno states but, in but, 1945. Okay, well, but but no, no. The, ask, ask, what but what states were not ethno states? The difference is that the, this was the state of the Jewish people, meaning, meaning any Jew around the world could come there and have rights and have more rights than the people who originally lived there. More rights than the people who originally lived there is, is that right now yes. they don't have more rights. Well, except they have they have a, like do they have some more rights? They have some more rights. Israelis but, have a lot more rights than the Palestinian Arabs who have who've been allowed to stay inside uh, 1948 Israel. Right. Yes, they do. So Benny Morris on the on the issue of the expulsion. So you know that Benny Morris, who is really the expert on all. This. Yeah, well, the Israeli expert. Yes, he is. No, even Finkelstein is, has has. Well, Finkelstein has disagreed with his conclusions, but he's never disagreed with Morris's facts. He certainly was, in, t- in terms of Israeli scholarship, he was, he's the main person. Yes. So he said, most of the Palestinians, 700,000. So just so people know, on, in, when the, and you correct my history, when the UN partitioned, the two, people could, the two peoples could not live together. Finkelstein said to me, I asked him, did he agree with the partition? He said, yeah, there was no, there was no way they could live together. He said it to me in the olive tree. When the UN created... The, tried to create the two states. I believe the next day a civil war broke out, and then five Arab armies attacked. And in that melee, that this is when the seven hundred thousand were moved not to another country. False. Really. By the time the Arab states intervened in May nineteen forty eight, half of those more than seven hundred thousand people that's, that's what I said. had already been expelled. I by said Israel. a civil war started. Okay, but it was it, I would call them expulsions. The the Zionist militias expelled people, committed massacres. Yeah, we're, yes. Well, so we'll get there. But I'm just okay. saying that the, the how whatever word you want to use to the fact that these people were, were out. Mm-hmm. This began after the partition, mm-hmm. not before. Mm-hmm. Started with the the civil war, mm-hmm. which was the Palestinian people, and then they were joined yeah. by the five Arab nations. I don't even think I'm saying anything tendentious okay. yet. Well, I, I, I don't mean to. But, but okay. Right, all right. So, so Morris, who is the expert, mm-hmm. says most of the 700,000 refugees, 
he puts the refugees in quotes, fled their homes because of the flail of war and the expectation that they would shortly return to their homes on the backs of victorious Arab invaders. But it is also true that there were several dozen sites, including Lida and, and Ramallah, Ramla, from which the Arab communities were expelled by Jewish troops. The displacement of the 700,000 Arabs who became refugees, and I put the term in inverted commas, as two-thirds of them were displaced from one part of Palestine to another and not from their country, which is the usual definition of a refugee, was not a racist crime, but the result of a national conflict and a war with Israel, with religious overtones from the Muslim perspective, launched by the Arabs themselves. Okay, and... Uh, is he incorrect there? Well, he's, he's, his conclusions don't support the facts that he has brought to light based on the Israeli archives. The term I've seen him use... He's, for, the, guy, he's the guy who covered like, the Israeli the, the, the term I've seen him use for what Israel did to the Palestinians is ethnic purification. That's his term, which sounds to me a lot like ethnic cleansing. And that's exactly what he describes in his books, which is, includes documented massacres like in Dar Yassin. Um, and that was just... That, that is now established well, fact. Is there a it, Palestinian scholar who's uncovered the Palestinian massacres? Do, do you, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is... There's no parody. How many here. people died at Dar es Salaam? Uh, hundreds of people. Let's, let's look at. There, there's no parody here. Um, you have, you know, look. I can show you a million quotes from Zionist leaders recognizing uh, that they were just you know, 117. Ben, no, I'm sorry, 254. Okay, you know, Ben Gurion even recognized that this country was stolen from Palestine. There's no, a quote no, from no. there's a quote from him in the late 70s. There's, there's quotes there's it, it, quotes of everything from everybody. Well, either they're fake or they're not. I mean, uh, yeah, I have no reason no, to No, but there's contradictory quotes. Okay. They're well, be, all I know is that Benny Morris described what Israel did as ethnic purification and he documents in his I, books. I've never seen that. So so you, stop, you wanted to take it a step by step in history what what's the reason I, I just wanted to I I've never seen Benny Morris use uh, the the term ethnic eth Google it. Okay. And uh there are many more books that have come out based on the Israeli archives. I don't think 1948 is an issue of, of much debate anymore. It was when I was growing up. And when I went to Sunday school and summer camp, I was told a bunch of— says, Ben Morris says he sees the Jews as, as the greater— because Morris later denied the term ethnic cleansing with regard to the actions undertaken by Jewish forces in Israel during the year 1948. He said— that possibly the term might apply in a limited or partial context to Lod or Ramla. Well, what Benny Morris has also said, and, and I'll find where he said ethnic purification, his point was that it didn't go far enough. And he's, he said we should have finished the job. And that's his point. No. Yes, because he supported it. No, no. Yes, that, he that, did. This is where you're not. No, I know what you're talking. There's an interview. Then we'll move on to the. There's an interview where Benny Morris did it. Benny Morris did in uh, Haaretz with uh, what the fuck? Shlavi? I forget his name. Where. He said that in retrospect, it might have been better if the Arabs had been moved out, given what the history has been and what it uh, and and the lack of optimism for the future. Meaning that it would have happened, and it would have been over with. They were moving from this side of the line to that side of the line. And and then it would then and then over time, it would disappear. Now, this is one of those things where are you li you're listening to me. I'm listening. This to is you. one of these things where at the time to suggest that would be outrageous because people have rights. In retrospect, it's not a, it's not it's not an, to me an offensive thought because look at what we're dealing. Look at how many. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are suffering, are c continuing to suffer. I mean, let me give you a, a, another, it's a glib example, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's crazy. In this country, we move people to build shopping centers. We will, with, with eminent domain, we will, we will pay people, and, and, and paying people is probably, a, would be a good thing, one way to settle this in a two-state solution someday, God willing, would be to pay the, Pay, pay people off for this. But we move people. We say, listen, we're building a shopping center here. You got to go. Okay. And we're going to buy your but house. That's not what but, happened here. No, it's but, not what happened. But I'm saying, but, but, but people move. Okay. And I don't, accept, but, I, don't, I don't accept the right of a European Zionist to come in and move an indigenous Palestinian I mean, just, by just, waving just, around a Bible on, just, from just, 2000 Just so years nobody, ago. so my, my, yeah. my, 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 my only point is, not that it was okay to do it, that the consequence of moving. Uh-huh. 
although it's very unfair if somebody does it to you, in, 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 is then you're, you're in, within the same country. Mm-hmm. Going forward, wouldn't what Benny Morris was saying, well, wouldn't it have been better if like, everybody just moved to this other side of the line and then there wouldn't be these wars anymore. Okay, but the that's, problem is- That's but, what he said. The problem is is, the, am, I being unf- am, I, am I not okay. describing what he said? Let's, let's assume that your characterization is correct. He's still accepting the premise that, we, that, it, that Zionists had the right to displace- No, he never, he, never, he never said they had the right. Okay. What he said was- Given that re- it happened, they should have gone away with it. No, he didn't even say that. Okay. What he said was, in retrospect, it might have been better. Okay, well, so yes, he's, yes sure. He, so, so he's doing a counterfactual. Fine. Uh, let me quote you also what he said. He said that transfer, quote, was inevitable and built in Zionism because it sought to transform a land which was an Arab into a Jewish state, and a Jewish state could not have arisen without a major displacement of Arab population. And that's from Benny Morris's birth of the Palestinian refugee problem. And the quote about ethnic purification, that is Chomsky translating Benny Morris from Hebrew. I'll send you both those references. So he's acknowledging there that a Jewish state could not have arisen without a major displacement of the Arab population. Yes, but, but the displacement didn't have to be violent displacement. It could be by... by uh, okay, but it was yeah. violent. But displacement would not the right to come back and would not the, have the same rights in the same area. All right. right? All right. Now, we need to move on, but I, I want to know, because I know we, you want to talk about a lot of stuff. I, I also want to talk about a couple things, but you wanted to go step by step in history. What's, I, I just want to know what's the reason. Okay, so, let, so let's, let's get to where uh, Aaron, Aaron did a long tweet yesterday, and I think this tweet was very interesting. It would be a good thing. We can break it up into pieces um, to, to discuss everything. If you're endorsing Israel's Gaza assault by declaring that Israel has the right to defend itself, then you're also endorsing the October 7th attack. If Israel can slaughter civilians in the name of defending itself, then Palestinians can too. They were ethnically cleansed in 1948 and have been occupied since 1967. Israel has refused to end the occupation and rejected the only diplomatic solution with international, including PLO, Hamas, and Arab states' support. An Israeli withdrawal from the West Bank and Gaza and a creation of a Palestinian state there, a huge compromise for Palestinians in 22% of their ancestral land. Actually, before we, before we get to this, because mm-hmm. I'm not sure, are you against what Hamas did on October 7th? Yes. So what, what do you, what, what, tell me your position on that. Well, um, the killing of civilians can't be justified. So um, if Hamas had just targeted military bases... Uh, I certainly would not criticize that, but I would criticize it uh, only from the point of view if it, you know, set back Palestinian liberation, which I think it really did. Uh, I'd love to be proven wrong, but I think what Hamas did for the purposes of Palestinian freedom was a disaster. And look at the consequences now. I think yeah. they gave Israel a big gift, and they let and they gave Israel um, a uh, grounds to tr- to now take advantage of that and, and do what and they've they always meant- wanted to do, which is transfer people out of Gaza and slaughter them. And they so, managed to recruit even more people now, all these kids going Yeah, up. so from yeah. that point of view, the point of view now, but I'm, I'm not Palestinian, and also I'm not living under occupation, so there are limits on my opinion in terms of whether this was uh, beneficial for the, the Palestinian long-term cause or not, because I'm not I, living under... But, but in terms of killing civilians... People are saying they're not occupied. I understand well, that, they are, uh, that there's a blockade. Yes, and Israel but, still controls everything about Gaza, and they're totally, you know, Go ahead. They're even though they withdrew their settlers in 2005, that doesn't mean they're not occupied. So you don't agree with Finkelstein on this Nat Turner argument of his? I don't, no. I, I what, understand what's, what's the argument for people listening? Norman Finkelstein's argument is that just like the slave, Nat Turner's slave rebellion, um, yeah. where they basically did the same things, <laughs> killed babies and all uh-huh. that kind of stuff, that... Um, this was somehow, I want to be fair to his position, that this was... This was a slave revolt, yeah. That this was like, uh, like almost like a battered wife syndrome kind of excuse Th- this for, was, for murder. Th- this was, his argument is that these were hopeless people trapped in a cage their whole lives, looking ahead to a wretched existence where Israel would control their every movement, people who have all probably had family members killed or have suffered under Israeli occupation, which is brutal and savage, um, you know, Israel won't let even some cancer patients leave the territory to get treatment. 
you know, there's a huge list of savagery. Right, so, 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 anyway, so his okay. his argument is this was a revolt by those slaves, and I I don't see Hamas don't that way. That. Yeah. I, I I I mean I I don't fully accept it. No. Can I say yeah. something before you go to the yeah. to the tweet? Um, you know, uh, obviously a lot of people have been asked about the seven. You know, and a lot of people have been condoned with this evidence, Arab and Muslims and all that. You know, but uh, what's interesting to me, and obviously I'm against it and against killing civilians, but what's interesting to me is the starting talking points always on the 7th, you know, where it should be years before that. You know, what led to that? A lot of things led to the 7th. It didn't start on that day. There's a lot of things that done by Israeli government as well, Netanyahu. We talked about it before. I agree, and that's the point of my tweet where I say that if you are endorsing this assault on Gaza by claiming Israel's, in the name of claiming that Israel has a right to defend itself, then you're also endorsing the logic of the October 7th attack, which says that Palestinians are under attack, much worse attack than Israel because they've been occupied for decades and routinely killed, routinely had their land stolen. And so you're saying then it's, if it's okay to kill innocent civilians in uh, Gaza because of one attack on October 7th, then you're saying that Palestinians have a right to kill civilians because no, that's not the same thing. It's the same. Uh, it's obviously in not fact, the same Palestinians thing. have a stronger argument because they're the ones who are occupied. I, so if anything, hold, if anything, hold, my, my only mistake hold. is I had too much parody okay. in that tweet. Well, there's, two, there's two. There's two parts to what you're saying. Let's take them one at a time. Okay. The targeting of let's just say 250 people at a concert is not the same thing as innocent civilians dying in a war as, as they say, collateral damage. Now, now the, the second part is more interesting, but, but they're not, they're not the same. If Israel went in and murdered no. and rounded up 250 people and killed them in a pen or something, then I'd say that's the same thing. But obviously, if Israel is attempting to root out Hamas, you might think they had no justification for doing that, but it's not the same thing. No. But the problem is, am I wrong? Your, yes, your point presumes parity. Is that these are two equal sides? No, I'm not. One side I'm not, is. I'm not one presuming side, parity. One side is occupied. I'm not one presuming s- parity. I'm. Pr- I'm saying that the that the targeting of well, then maybe you do support Finkelstein's position. I I support the premise that Palestinians have the right to resist military occupation, and that Israel has no right to fire a single bullet into Gaza. Their only obligation so, is to so, stop so, occupying. So if it. they're the same thing, then what you're saying is that. If Israel kills 250 civilians on purpose uh-huh. or kills 250 Hamas fighters on purpose, that's the same okay. thing? If we're talking about October 7th. Wait, wait, just, what, no, no, is that no, the hold same? Second, hold no, second. no, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll answer anything you want, but you have to answer me first. Are you saying that's the same thing? Okay, am I, okay answer, uh, is it the same for Israel to kill Hamas militants uh, as it is for Palestinians? Because I'm, I'm saying it's not the same thing to kill, when Hamas kills 250 people at a concert, that's not the same thing as when Israel has collateral damage of 250 people. You're saying it is the same thing. I'll say, well, okay, then, is it depends, it, does it matter who Israel okay. kills? It depends what date we're on. If we're on October 7th and Israel is killing the militants that are attacking its civilians, they have every right to do that. They have every right to do that. But we're not talking about October 7th anymore. It's more than a month later. Israel's killed, at this point, more than 11,000 people. That's on probably October updated. 8th, if Israel wants to go they in... They have no right to do that. They only have the obligation and their occupation. So, what, so hold on. Occupiers well, don't let's, the, let's explore that. Occupiers so, don't, have, don't have the right to defend themselves because they're, what they're doing there is defending their occupation. So then what if October 8th, Hamas comes in again? They have every right to shoot back against Hamas. Absolutely. And what yeah. if they kill another 1,200? If, if Hamas kills another 12... Well, then... That's on Israel for not ending its occupation. But, well, but you how, can't just occupy. How do they, but how do they end the occupation? With Hamas? Hamas is not interested in ending the occupation. Well, Hamas has been interested in ending the Hamas occupation. Hamas has never, never Hamas accepted a two-state to, solution. Yes, they have. No, they have not. They, okay. even, they even rejected the, Arab, the Saudi proposal. They initially did, certainly. No. Listen, they, should we go through they, the history? Until recently, they, they should rejected. Should we go through the history? In about 2007, I may have the dates wrong, but around then... The leadership of, and there is a split inside Hamas. So yes, there are people in Hamas who will never accept Israel at all. Well, there you go. So let's, okay. let's, no, let's hold on. No, let's let me take this. My point. Let's take this. No, I, don't, I want to understand your position about, but, about okay, international law. Sentence. Wait, well, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I will. I, I know we're something. We're on the two-state thing. And okay, Hamas in 2007. But I don't want to get off this because this. Okay, I want to. I don't want. I don't want to let you off because I think what you're saying Hamas, is not defensible. Hamas leaders in 2007 started saying we would accept a two-state solution, and they even put. And then in 2017, in their charter, they even put we would accept a Palestinian state. In the occupied territories. Now, they also said we'll never recognize Israel.
But if you're accepting a state within the uh, borders of 1967, which is a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza, you're tacitly then recognizing the, the Israeli borders outside of it. Israel, because it's run by extremists, has never accepted those borders, and they've refused to accept a Palestinian okay. state because okay. they want to carve up okay, the West say, Bank so to let's, take the settlements let's presume for and the, the water there. So let's examine your theory of the law. So let's presume for the sake of argument, because it has been true at certain times, mm -hmm. that Hamas is not going to accept a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. Can Israel then defend itself? No, because they're still the occupying power, and they've never offered a reason. So every day, Israel has to have people come in there, kill their civilians, if and they cannot fight back. If you're making the choice to be an occupier— They're not making the choice. They've made that choice for the How, for how the, did they become an 50, occupier? In 1967. Jordan attacked. No, they, no, they did not. No. Okay, the official story of 67, Israel claims that they were going to attack. Israel fired the first shots. Now, if you want to claim that, that the, if you want to accept the Israeli position that that was being preemptive, uh, then you can accept that. But there are plenty of people like Moshe Dayan, who was an Israeli general, said, I know how this started. We were firing into Syria trying to start a provocation, which is Israel has always done. They did the same thing in Lebanon in 82. So Israel claims they, that they acted to defend themselves. But nobody disputes that Israel fired the first shots. Israel started that war. I, I believe they, they started it by bombing Egypt first. I, yeah, I, and they ended up. Is, they Aaron, ended up. They ended up. Hold on a second. The but I'm shocked sentence, that you're saying something so wrong. One more sentence. They ended up seizing in that war, the Sinai, the Golan Heights from so the Sinai from Egypt, the Golan Heights of Syria, as well as Gaza and the uh, and the West Bank. Hold on a second. How many defensive wars end with Israel and, and Aaron, with countries acquiring all this territory Aaron, that they've long coveted? You're incorrect. Okay, Let, let's hear it. The, the you're right that Egypt that Israel fired the first shots. Thank with you. Egypt. Okay. Yes. But Jordan attacked Israel. Okay. Hold on. And as a matter of after, fact, after, before, or after uh, Israel attacked Egypt. After. Thank you. So but Israel started that war. It with Egypt. Okay, and that was a, that doesn't mean that every other country in the world they, can. While they were also shelling. Hold on. Now, while Israel was also shelling. Now I'm going to read you. I'm going to read you about. I'm going to read you okay. from King Hussein's book now. Okay. Hold on. While Israel was also shelling before the, before June '67 into Syria, trying to hold start on. a provocation. These are there different too. countries. Yeah, and they were, okay, and Israel wanted to take all their territory. So, no, it, it, each, Israel sent a message to King Hussein of Jordan, and you certainly know this. They said, "Don't invade us. We have no problem with you." This was delivered to the King of Jordan, uh -huh. and he attacked anyway. Well, because he was in an alliance with other Arab. But that's states. his problem. Well, it's still a, it, that's no, his I'm problem. Sorry. He had already seen what Israel did in '48. And they're all together. And Israel's Aaron, bombing. Israel's bombing Egypt. Aaron, shelling the, the, Syria. How matter how you want to slice it. Uh huh. The the territory was occupied because Israel was attacked, not because they attacked. No matter how you slice it. You want it, me to free? Okay, listen. The, I, the I, Egyptian I, one. Now let, let me read you from I, King Hussein's book about the, the okay. war. I, I believe okay. he's a good source. This was so it's it, King Hussein's memoirs is him, and then he has some other people. I guess he had right for him. I don't mm -hmm. know. So. Uh, so when Nasser closed the Straits of Tehran, this is what, is what happened. Nasser yeah. closed the Straits of Tehran to stop all shipping, which was, which was a cause of how you spell the causes belli. When you, when, you know, blockades are considered acts of war. And he, he removed the UN peacekeepers and he mobilized 100,000 troops, I believe, in the Sinai. So Israel was— uh, Well, he couldn't have mob he, The Sinai is Egypt. Yes, he mobilized in, in his in his land so, on the so, border so, with Israel. So, so, so but Jordan, so okay, but, but not in the Sinai because Jordan didn't have the Sinai. That, no, not Egypt. Jordan. Nasser was Nasser. Okay, got it. Okay, Nasser yeah. is ahead of Egypt. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When Nasser closed the straits, the king, ugh, the king realized this. This is King Hussein. Uh huh. That war was inevitable. Mm -hmm. As a withdrawal of the UN emergency force, Jordan was neither consulted nor warned. It was from the Cairo radio that we picked up on these two fairly important bits of information, as did the rest of the Arab world and the Soviets, which who complained bitterly. This is how it all happened. On the morning of Monday, May 22nd, I was at my desk in the palace as usual, and I received a telephone call from Radio Oman informing me that Radio Cairo had just announced the closing of the Gulf of Aqaba. At 1 p.m., the king arrived in his office. He called me in. He'd already heard the news. He was deeply troubled. This is very serious, he said. I think war is inevitable now. That was... Uh, um, the, the guy who worked with King Hussein is in his book. Then King Hussein writes in his own uh, words. Let me not spend time. He says, here it is. Ugh. Um, After the Arab-Israeli conflict, there was a great deal. This is King Hussein's own words. 
After the Arab-Israeli conflict, there was a great deal of controversy over who should bear the responsibility for starting hostilities. Does an act of aggression necessarily involve the use of arms? Might not closing the Straits of Tehran be considered an act of an aggression? What in, uh, what in fact is an act of aggression? Basically, Tehran was only one of several weapons used in the atmosphere of hostility, which, ever since the partition of 1947, plunged the Middle East into this tragedy we all suffer. Yes, Tehran was the trigger in a series of aggressive acts and reciprocal threats dating from 1948. That does not take away from the fact that Tehran was a mistake. I am well aware of it. Without question, we could have acted differently. Okay, wait. So is the Did argument, you hear what? That is, is the, the is, king of no, Jordan. Okay. Is the who, argument, who is, you have a more extreme position. <laughs> yes, I do. But, on the Six-Day War but, the, but, than, the, than he, the man who a, fought the war. I, I have an First idea. Point. I have an idea. No, but I, hold on a second. Are you saying that because— I'm not people, saying. He's saying. Okay, is, okay, That's the it, king. Is your, he fought the war. Is your argument that because the king said that the closure of the strait, it was a provocation, that that justifies Israel taking— Palestinian territory and occupying them since, since 67. Um, and, and also, also, uh, also. Yes, I, don't see, I, don't I am. See, I'll tell you and, why. And I will also, tell you by why. By the way, by it. the way, just as a historical aside, and we're getting way too in the weeds. This and, is not and, the weeds. This no, is the fundamental no, part of okay, the conflict. Okay. Uh, also, Israel was barely impacted by that closure. Uh, you can read about that in Finkelstein's work. There's a book uh, uh, called The Iron Wall by Abi Schleim, who's an Israeli historian. He's at Oxford, I believe. You can read all about this history there. And you read, you, Finkelstein also, has said that he, he thinks Israel oh, was barely impacted. But but okay, around the world, second. everybody no. thought this was an act. And No, listen, but it's, it's no reason to start a war. No. Because someone closed out. Close out no, the, re the reason to start it. the war was there were 100,000 troops on the border. No. Listen, listen. After a series listen, of Israeli Aaron, provocations. Aaron, Aaron, there was, Aaron, there was, there was There was Israeli attacks going on inside Jordan for a very, very long time. Aaron. Aaron, this is all it's part very of the easy history. for you to say. No, but it's true. No, it's not. And, and, and I learned this from actually, for, from, mostly from reading Israeli historians like like Avi Schleim. Okay. okay? Let, uh, like, it, there's a book called The Iron Wall. It's all about this period of 67. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I don't, and, but regardless, even if you're right, okay, one yeah. more point. How does it justify a, uh, whatever, 56-year military I'm gonna occupation? You. you asked it three times. You know, I'm going to answer you uh, So it's like, okay, it, let's say in 67, all the Arab states Let were me wrong. answer it for you. Okay, go ahead. So, first of all, a few things. First of all, um, for instance, Norman Finkelstein. Actually, uh, this is a good this is a good uh, uh, thing to play. Be before you say, can I say something in the 1967? The 1967, since I'm the only Egyptian actually guy here, yeah. you forgot a very major point that the UN and the US said whoever is going to attack first in 1967, they're going to be against. And Israel attacked Egypt first, and nobody right. was against. Now, the UN has so, nothing to do with this. Okay, so listen, this is, I want to make the point to you that it's very easy to expect others to take chances with their lives. But as we know, these things sometimes come out famously wrong. For instance, what happened in Gaza. Now play this, play the video that I just queued up. This was Norman Finkelstein a few years ago, maybe on your show, I don't know, I forget what show it is, saying that Israel shouldn't worry about the tunnels. Let's be clear about the facts. There were not terror tunnels. There were about According to Israel, there are about 12 to 14 tunnels that were built beneath uh, the border separating Gaza from Israel. Now, here are the facts, and the facts are not trivial. Number one, the UN Human Rights Council report found, and respected Israeli journalists, Israeli, soldier, uh, Israeli military people, they all said the same thing. The tunnels did not target civilians. Every time Hamas militants emerged from the tunnels, they had uh, firefights with Israeli soldiers. They never went to the kibbutzim. They never targeted civilians. They were in terror tunnels. So this is where a, a tiny country like Israel, very tiny at the time, when 100,000 troops mass on its border— it says, you know, we're not going to wait for, uh, for this to happen. It's, it's pretty clear to us what's going on here. And if you don't mean war, then you shouldn't act exactly like a country that means war. And it's easy to judge, but people get it wrong. So Israel took out the Egyptian uh, Air Force and, and, and uh, took the Sinai, occupied the Sinai. And they took Gaza, but what they did, but what they did not, but hold up, but what they did not do, all for defensive purposes. But what they did not do 
is attack Jordan or make a move towards the, what are now called the occupied territories. That happened in response to a Jordanian attack. And now this is one of the mistakes that Israel did make because Israel has made mistakes. Ben-Gurion, of all people, Ben-Gurion, who you, this is why when you quote these things, it's, you know, it's, it's such a cherry pick. Ben-Gurion was the one Israeli voice at the, right after 67 who recommended Israel give it all back. Give it all back. He was a lone voice to give it all back. But the rest of Israel felt that they should give it back in return for an agreement for a peace treaty. And as you know, in Khartoum and Sudan, right after that, they, they, there were three no's, no, no peace, no recognition. Yeah. No, and and, and then, then the dance started. But that's how the occupation started. No. And then I'll no. continue. No. Then, and then Finkelstein made a good point. Then in, when, when Nasser died, um, <clears throat> Sadat took over. And he was not taken that seriously at first, considered to be lightweight. And there was this uh, Gunner Jarring, I think it was. There was this proposal by this UN guy jarring that Israel didn't really take that seriously. And then Sadat started the 73 war, which actually led to peace, ironically. But um, there was no progress on the West Bank. Of course, Jordan didn't want the land back. It would be perfectly natural to give it back to Jordan, right? Jordan didn't even want it back. And ever since then, Israel has been on and off again, Trying to give it back, and this no, and this will no, bring us to where no. I feel that you were that you are that you were not acting as a journalist. If you want me to go there, okay. But can I say a few things first? Yeah. Um, first of all, I don't accept the premise of your argument, which is that somehow Egypt putting forces on its borders justifies the Israeli war of conquest. Well, I don't accept your premise that if Egypt gets in a war with Israel, that Jordan can attack. Well, that's they. Uh, Israel was attacking all these places. No. There, there have been Israeli operations inside Jordan for years after 1948. Jordan attacked because at the too. last minute, like, like I think a week, okay. two weeks before, it signed a, it signed a, Let me say it one signed thing. a treaty with Egypt. Yeah, okay. Yeah, to, which to, Israel to, knew. Which Israel knew. So, it, so, so Israel, by attacking Egypt, Egypt, knew exactly what it was but getting Jordan, into. Because, because Nasser Israel, wanted to—, to, to, to but, but, but don't you see, from Israel's point of view, this, they you, did everything okay. they could do to make it look like a war was going to start. Can I make my point? Why? why you, right, right before— Can I make Israel, my point? Yeah, you, Egypt puts 100,000 troops there. Then they go to Jordan to sign a treaty. How many, how many Israeli troops are there? Listen, like, listen— if you if you had told me that you wanted to talk about the 1967 war, what I would have done is you, reread the relevance. Hold on a second, reread the relevant sections of books like Avi Schleim's Iron Wall, so I could get a. It, it, it's been a long time. What I do know is that Israel was shelling Syria before 67, uh, and vice versa. Moshe Dayan said 80 percent of the shelling came from us. Okay. Because they were trying to provoke a war. Because they because Zionist leaders. From uh, Ben Gurion to Menachem Begin, and all said, "We'll never accept partition. This, we, Sy- this is Syria all of is our not land." Part of this story. Now. Well, Syria is sixty-seven. They took it over, and they still have it. It's still occupied. And so, somehow, magically, you want me to believe that a Israel launched this defensive war, in which they happen to end up with all this territory that they've coveted, and then they don't give it back because they're doing their best to give it back, but these these uh, these stubborn Arabs won't take it back. Well, that, and, that's, that's the premise here. But no, this, Israel, this is where... Israel, hold on a second. Yeah. One more point. Yeah. After Israel takes the West Bank and Gaza, yeah. Moshe Dayan, the famed Israeli general, uh, who was actually considered a dove on the Israeli spectrum, he said uh, basically that the way it's going to work in the territories is, quote, you will live like dogs and anybody who wants to leave can leave. That's Moshe Dayan talking about the Palestinians. And they proceeded to build up these massive Israeli settlements after 67, which is not a sign of wanting to give it back. That's a sign of colonization. How do you explain the fact that you have these huge settlements that make life in, in the West Bank for Palestinians impossible, that cut the West Bank in half, that steal their water? What, what is that? How is that possibly a part of an effort to give the land back? And every time there's been a reasonable proposal on the table, which, by the way, is a huge compromise for Palestinians, I have a hard time trying to sell pal- a Palestinian on a two-state solution because you're, actually ask, you're asking them to give up— uh, to accept the state in twenty-two percent of their land, so it's a big compromise. Israel won't even give them that. They've and they've never twenty-two percent of land, including Jordan. 
n- not including Jordan, 22% of historic so, Palestine. So, is Jordan so, part of historic Palestine? No. no. So can, can, can I, can I, I want to say sure. two things. First, I, I, need, I think we should move okay. forward so, because don't, we want to go to the current I, I, events. I, 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 I'm asking that. So, so first of all, you know, the, a lot of that is desert. Anyway, but um, so, so we, 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 this is why I didn't want to do it because we got off it. So you're saying that if even if Hamas rejects a two-state solution, even if Hamas wants Palestine from the river to the sea, mm-hmm. that Israel has no right to ever uh, go to war with Hamas. Uh, not ever, but but the point is they don't have the right to attack Gaza so long as they're occupying it. No, that's what I mean. Occupiers don't have self-defense rights. They only have the obligation to leave. But even if, but but on October seventh, if Hamas is inside of Israel and they're attacking people, yes, you fight back, you defend yourself. But on October sixth, there shouldn't have been an occupation. And October eighth, there shouldn't have. And October so, for, 7th so, too. so by that logic, you're saying that even though Hezbollah is who is not Palestinian, is throwing is sending rockets into Israel and north. Israel has an occupation, has an obligation to leave the Golan Heights and cede that ground to these Hezbollah. That's what you're saying. No, I'm not saying that. Yes, it, well, Golan, Golan no, Heights no, is, no. is occupied, no, right? But the Golan Heights is Syrian territory. Lesbo- uh, it's occupied by Israel. Yes. So, so, is, so by exactly the same thing, no, you're saying, no. what do you mean no? He- Hezbollah is inside Lebanon. Hezbollah is in Syria and has, in Syria and Lebanon. Yeah. In Syria uh, and no. Lebanon. Hezbollah is not attack is not launching rockets from Syria. They're only launching rockets from Lebanon. Now, it, Israel's obligation to leave, it's called the, the there is a small part of Lebanese territory that Israel the still The point stole. is that if if Israel gives up the Golan Heights, then these heights, why do they why do they annex the Golan Heights? Because these heights look over their population. And they have no right to it. Right. So they you're saying that it. even even if Hezbollah is there, they're not in rock- the Golan Heights. Hezbollah is in Lebanon and Hezbollah was created and by Syria. The, and as soon as and no, if I'm sorry. It, Hezbollah is not firing on Israel from Syria. They, They're as not. soon as Israel leaves, if Israel were to leave the... Well, that's op- why you make a peace treaty. With Hezbollah? Sure. But what if these people say, we'll never make peace with you? Well, then you at least have to try. And when has Israel ever tried? Uh, so uh, Israel, uh, but Israel Hezbollah for, for, is going to yes. make peace with Israel? Isn't Hezbollah an arm of Iran? Iran doesn't even recognize Israel. Sure, but Iran is also saying... They don't even recognize oh, okay. Israel. Iran has a more accommodating position on the question of peace than Israel does. But can, by can, far. can, can, can I say second. something? Yeah. One second. Iran has said we would accept the 2002 Saudi peace initiative, which is Israel withdraws from all the occupied territories in exchange for full normal... Including the Wailing Wall, including giving back the Israel... And you have you have Palestinian sovereignty, uh, you you have an international resolution to Jerusalem, and you, you give Palestinians... Eastern and, a, and, a, and the right of return. A just resolution to the right of return, not the yeah, full, well, not that, a full... Right. A just, re, which right. is fair. Yeah, but don't give you... Give people the right to return. Hold on. So a, a just resolution... So Iran said they support that. No, 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 no. Yes, but, they did. But, no, no. Which means I'm they're more no, but, accommodating but than Israel. Stop. Stop for a second. I'm not saying Iran didn't support it. I'm saying I don't know if Iran supported it. I'm saying that I can show you the reference. when you have a peace plan which says and a just resolution, yes. if it says that, mm-hmm. I think you understand that means that you could have years of of squabbling. That's better than the status quo right, of but, bomb of occupying and but bombing. It means people. that Israel can't just pull out. Yes, they must immediately engage in good faith negotiations. Right, they've never ever done. They've ever. never had good faith negotiations. No, never. So, but but let, okay. So let's say they were having good faith negotiations. The one time they but hold on. Let's say they were having good faith negotiations, and Hamas tacked. At that point, could Israel bomb Hamas? Yes, if you have good faith negotiations, and that and so international law has a good faith negotiations exception. Yes, because as an occupying, I never heard that. So, so as an occupying power, you have the uh, obligation to end your uh, to end your occupation, and if if there are extenuating circumstances. Then okay, fine. Obviously, then if Israel's being attacked as they're trying to give all this land they've stolen back, fair enough. So this we're is not what talk, we're, we're not talking about. That. This we're, is what you. We're talking you about speak. a belligerent occupier that's never given its land back. And the what, one time, this the, is this the is what one you're time up. they engage in a peace, an actual peace process called the Oslo peace process. Do you want to know what Shlomo Ben Ami, who's a former Israeli foreign minister, I'm so happy you're saying that. I was about to read. It. He called this it. A, a you're neo, about to tell a lie. He, he called it a. He called it a neo colonial project. Oslo, the peace process. Okay, you, not good you, faith. You said that Ben Ami said yes of the camp of the 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 the. Peace process. Uh, of the, I, if, it, if I were Palestinian, I would have rejected it as well. He said of the July 2000 Camp David offer, which uh, was brokered I'm by sorry, Clinton. Of the July 2000, I, I would have— And Hood Barak offered a quote-unquote Palestinian state to Arafat. Uh, so let me read the whole tweet. I'll read your yeah. tweet verbatim. Uh-huh. The claim that Palestinians have been offered a state independent of Israel, but they turned it down, is a lie mm-hmm. used to justify the violence and occupation. 
Shlomo Ben Ami said of Israel's 2000 Camp David offer, which Hillary cites, if I were a Palestinian, I would have rejected Camp David as well. Yes, he said That's that. That's because the Palestinians had never been offered an actual state. Yes. Just West Bank cantons. Okay. Yes. Now, I did so much research on this okay. in good faith. I tried desperately to find it. I'll give you the computer to find anybody who can point to these can- this canton map. There are two maps that, I, that are available um, bring up, uh, these are the, there's one of them is from Benny Morris's book and one is from, I think Al Jazeera, uh, was the, um, uh, Olmert map. These are their versions of the last maps. The one on the left is the later one. So it's slightly, uh, more, uh, uh, Olmert, uh, agreed to pull out a hundred settlements. I believe. Okay, now we're talking about Ehud Olmer, which is not Shlomo Ben Ami. He's talking about Ehud Barak in 2000. Okay, so, about, so the one on the right is 2000. Okay. Barak offered to give Israel, uh, give Arabs uh, uh, sovereignty over the Temple Mount. This came out. No, wait. Olmer or Barak? Because Barak. It, it, Barak. No, he did not. Yes, he did. No, he did not. Yes, no, he, he did not. Did. Right, no, he did not. No, he didn't. No, he yeah, didn't. He, no, he didn't. And that's why Shlomo Ben Ami, who was there, negotiating on behalf of Israel, even later said, if I were Palestinian, I would have rejected it. That's what he said, because he's honest enough to admit that no, but you're, Ehud Barak... This is where you're dishonest. You're referring to an earlier offer. I'm it's, referring to July 2000. That's what you quoted me on, Camp David. If you want to talk about what Ehud Olmer offered years later, that's fine. But we're, we're talking about July 2000. This is times that Israel agreed to give up sovereignty and part of Jerusalem old city in 2000. New, newly classified documents respond to Clinton peace proposal... Clinton proposal under Prime Minister Ehud Barak shows Jerusalem was willing to accept Palestinian sovereignty in much of the Temple Mount as a basis for the peace talks. This came out. I can't believe you don't know this. Okay, well, send that to me. What I understand of the Israeli offer is that they were not offering Palestinian sovereignty over East Jerusalem, which is a center of Palestinian life. And I would bet anything on this. They were offering Palestinians to have a place called Abu Dais, I believe it's called, and they could rename that al Quds. Uh, Jerusalem, if they wanted to, which is just okay. a joke. Can you that play? Was the Hood so, so Ben Ami, so Finkelstein makes exactly the same accusation as you do. Can you play the Ben Ami M, uh, M, uh, thing? And this is why I got so upset. You guys attack him on for saying something about an earlier proposal. I'm not attacking him. I'm in, I'm endorsing what he's saying. But in the same video, he specifically says yes. But that was the earlier proposal. I, July 2000. And this is the... This but is, December 2000... Important. There was no offer in December 2000. Oh, my there God. Was, there was continued... Any, talk, anybody home, just go- Google there it. There was continued talks in Taba, Egypt, but no formal offer. Yes, the Clinton- there was a, The only formal offer at this point is Camp David, July 2000. And Clinton blamed Arafat for rejecting it and said that they were offered this, this uh, great Palestinian state and these greedy Arabs wouldn't take it. And then the Antifada broke out and it's all their fault. That's what Clinton said, basically. Here's Shlomo ben Ami saying... If I were a Palestinian, I would have rejected that offer as well. Because he was there, he knows exactly what was offered. It was a joke. I pl- play what he said. If I were a Palestinian, I would have rejected Camp David as well. This is something I put in the book. The Clinton parameters are the problem. Because the Clinton parameters, in my view, well, the Clinton parameters say the following. They say that on the territorial issue, uh, the Palestinians will get 100% of Gaza, 97% of the West Bank, plus a safe passage from Gaza to the West Bank to make the, the state viable. Um, there will be a land swap. The 97%, which I mentioned, takes into account the land swap, where they will get 3% on this side. Within the state of within the state of Israel, so we will have the blocks of settlements, and they will and they will be able to settle refugees on this side on this side of the border. About Jerusalem, it says uh, uh, what is Jewish is uh, Israeli, and what is Palestinian is uh, sorry, and what is what is Arab is Palestinian. It includes full fledged sovereignty for the uh, Palestinians on Temple Mount, on the Haram al-Sharif, no sovereignty, no Jewish sovereignty on the Haram al-Sharif, which was at the time and continues to be a major, major uh, problem for, uh, for Israelis and Jews that, uh, that these, these, these things mean to them. Uh, I think, uh, I think that's enough of that. So, this, so I was so upset with you for leaving 
for making it seem like what he had said was that they had never been offered to stay. Now, let me read. No, I, I was quoting him talking about July 2000 at Camp right, but, David. But you make it sound like, no, you weren't just Hillary said they'd never been offered a stay. Okay, y- yes, but, never but not, he because, says we did offer no, a stay. No, we didn't. No, no, because now he's referring to the Clinton parameters, which were then yeah, used. I offered the, to buy his car for $100. No, okay, listen, and there then, was no And then offer. I offered him 500 There was no offer, And he though. says, you never offered me what you, I turned it down for 100 Yeah, but you also turned it down for 500 There was an offer in July 2000. Arafat turned that down. As Shlomo ben he should have, because he would have rejected it as well if he were a Palestinian. Then you have more talks going on uh, in Taba in Egypt in early two, in early two thousand. I believe it was in Camp David, and then it moved to Taba. Okay, and, okay. And, and so and 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 but there's no offer there. There okay. is some progress made, and it shows actually. It, uh, that's just more proof that the offer at Camp David Aaron, was a joke. I'm going to win you second. over. Oh, hold, hold I believe. I believe. I believe you're and actually then, uninformed, no, and that's why you say this and then, stuff. And then there's no. I offer. think we're going to come to there, an there's agreement. There's no here. offer in Taba. There's progress, but the problem is. Israel ends those talks, walks away. Israel, no, yes, no. they did. Okay, so and let me Ariel read. Sharon is elected prime minister. That's true. And, and all that stuff. So let me read you a There's bunch no of things. There's no offer. I, okay. I, 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 I spent a few hundred dollars getting the books <laughs> by everybody who was in the room. You could, okay, Dennis Ross. Yes, our uh, a, li- a lifelong Israeli apologist. Yeah, Dennis Ross. Fair enough, but, yeah. but he was also in the room. Uh-huh. And, and Robert Malley was also in the room on the U.S. side. Malley, he Malley, Malley he does not. Con- Malley well. does not. Malley contradicts. Malley talks about the, t- the the thing you're talking about, the earlier Camp David. Camp David. Thing. Yes. Malley does not talk about the Clinton parameters. I I, I read. I I had to subscribe okay, to the New York what, Review. What is, I had to, what is Dennis Ross? I had to subscribe to the New York Review of Books to read the Malley thing from from August. Yes, okay. that's an important article. Okay, so here's here's the, I have a few things I was going to read. Okay, Dennis Ross. Arafat's reservations were deal killers involving his actual rejection of the Western Wall, part of the formula on the Haram. That's the Temple Mount. His rejection yeah. of the most his, most basic elements of Israeli security needs and a dismissal of our refugee formula all were deal killers. Prince, Prince Bondar. Let me, oh, let let me, read let me respond to Ross first. No, because Ross is the least. I'm, I'm no, gonna, but, you know what? I'm going to stipulate Ross is an apologist. Okay, Prince Bondar <laughs> of Saudi Arabia said, since 1948, every time we've had something on the table, we say no. When we say yes, it's not on the table anymore. Then we have to deal with something less. Isn't it about time we say yes? If we lose this opportunity, it's not going to be a tragedy. It's going to be a crime. Martin Indyk. Yeah, but, uh, Mar- Bandar Martin- Bush, by the way, that's his nickname because he was so tight with. Okay, uh, Martin Indyk. Yeah. Arafat, in turn, would have had to possess the courage that Sadat showed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which he paid for lies. Arafat yeah. had none of that stuff. He repeated his reverence to fear of assassination. Uh-huh. Show how his survival, rather than the and idea. Martin putting- Indyk, to clarify, people, he's a former U.S. official, also a, an apologist. For, but he's but Martin yeah. Indyk is the guy that Peter Beinart cites as his source. I don't care. That he trusts. Okay, okay you know, I, I don't care. I, I, given the broader yeah. circumstances of personality, this is involved, his personal let, opinion. Let me read, by them, the way. Let me read but, them all. But it's, but it's their. It's like it's their opinion. Like I care about. Facts. Okay, I'll give you okay. facts. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I got the coup de grace. You're going to wait okay. for it. All right. Clinton, I'm going to skip some. Oh, wait. Uh, Indic says uh, Arafat went to Camp David to avoid a trap, not to make a deal. Clinton said both the Saudis and the Egyptian ambassadors in Washington, Bandar bin Sultan, Nabil Fahmy, came to encourage Arafat in the name of respective governments to accept the Arafat. To ex- uh, did I skip a page here? To accept the uh, I so plan. translation, wait, wait. lackey U.S. regime, Gulf regime, okay, okay. encourage Arafat to become a lackey. Arafat as well. that's, immediately that's began to equivocate, ask for clarifications. This is a uh, Barack. Oh, Cab- silly Arafat asking for clarifications. Hold on, like, for example, you know what? You know what he asked? He said, "Can I see a map?" Because they wouldn't even let him see a map. No, that was that was. Um, and in July 2000, hold, Camp David. I'm talking about Clinton parameters okay. in December. Yeah. Barack's cabinet endorsed the parameters with reservations, but all their reservations with res- were within the parameters. No, and therefore, well, that's a lie. That's a lie, and we know that because they recently got. Declassified. I looked at that and doesn't. Think Osteen wrote about. Yes, they, he, he wrote about, but he's wrong. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Clint, Clint says, I called several Arab leaders for help. King Abdullah and the President bin Ali of Tunisia tried to encourage Arafat. They told me he was afraid to make compromises. Saudi Crown Prince Abdullah. He was said to be shocked that Arafat had wasted such an opportunity. Yes. And he lied about the president's offer on Jerusalem. Arafat's rejection of the peace for Amherst was a crime, he said. Not even against the he Palestinians. He rejected them. Okay, they, but here, both sides had reservations. Okay, here is the coup both de grace. Side, both sides had reservations. And, and Israel's here reservations, is the by coup the way, de, were outside of the Clinton parameters. Here so is never the coup de grace, okay. and I ran this by Khalidi. Okay. Nabil Amr, you know about this? Who was a one of the who was part of the He's a PLO negotiator? Part right? of the negotiator okay, yeah. wrote a uh-huh. letter. Mm-hmm. And the letter said the following to Arafat. Mm-hmm. Didn't we throw mud in the face of Bill Clinton, who dared to propose a state with some adjustments? Wrote Amor in a letter. We were were we honest about what we did? Were we right in what we did? No, we were not. After two years of violence, we are now calling for what we rejected. 
Okay. What have we done with the Palestinian Legislative Council? What have we done with the judiciary system? What have we done with the money? What have we done with the bureaucracy? So it goes on. Yeah, he's calling out that the P- PLO is a So this is regime. the guy right. on Arafat's side uh-huh. saying, yeah. we were dishonest. We should have taken it. But Aaron Mate uh-huh. has, no. a, has, a, has a reason to taken, dismiss. He should have taken what? He was never offered Clint, anything. Aaron Mate, well, he no. he seems to think they were. Chris Bondar okay. thinks they were. What it sounds like. King Hussein okay. seems to think okay. every Ar- Can I talk now? Martin Indyk. Can I but talk? I'm, no, but what, what it sounds like he's you, saying is is we should have not had any reservations about the Clinton parameters. Okay. Uh, but it, it, but but basically, the position Palestine took is, is no different than what Israel took, because Israel also had reservations too. So the same thing could be said about Israel as well, at best. All right. Well, these guys, these guys, so- and the compromise already is a two-state solution because you're asking Palestinians to accept the theft of a lot of their land and a state within 22 percent. I'm not going to get into that. So with you. Th- that's the compromise. If, if, okay. if, if, if it is or it isn't, that that's, this is that's what was- the compromise. So yeah, but that, period. Hold on. You know, have you ever been sued? You ever been no, in legal action? no, thank God, no. You know, what everybody says, I'm never settling. It's, uh, people settle because I said, okay. this, I said this was a settlement. I said this to Finkelstein. Twenty two percent is a settlement, and, and this is really what I would really fault uh, more than anything uh, the Palestinians here for. There is a moral, there is a moral obligation to take what's practical. There are so many people dying over these minor. Uh, Points, whatever it is that they were arguing about, they had agreed to take out a uh, hundred settlements. Bring, bring the maps up again. No, Obviously, there's no oh, offer. Even, oh, there's no offer they've okay. ever. Khalidi said the reason they turned it down it was because Israel was going to keep the Jordan Valley. That's not true. Israel wanted the Jordan Valley for three years or six years until such time there as they could no- be sure of security. Israel does. Israel does have real security. Well, first of all, this is why Israel has real security threats because in '48 they were attacked. In 67. No, I'm sorry. They attacked in 47, expelled hundreds of thousands of people. No, in 47 they were attacked. In May, no, I'm sorry. They, they did not attack in 47. Yes, they did. No. The ethnic cleansing began in 47. In, Read about it in Benny Morris' the ethnic, book. The, the, Hold on a second. Let me talk now. No, no, no. What you claim, no, what you claim is that states, the cleansing started in 47, but they were not attacked. I mean, Arab, Israel was attacked. No, I'm sorry. Uh, Israel was not attacked in 47. Israel accepted the partition. Yes, and privately said we'll never accept it. They did not. They ben did not. Ben wrote that. Uh, but Begin they did not that. attack. Yes, they. they started, no, they no, started they eth- didn't. Read about it in Benny Morse. They started the ethnic cleansing in forty-seven. I just read you Benny Morse where he says they were attacked. Hundreds of thousands of people. I just were, read you Benny Morse. By the time the Arab states intervened in, in May nineteen forty-eight, oh, hundreds of thousands that. of Palestinians had already been expelled, including massacres. Okay, so the Arab states intervened to stop that. Can I attack Israel? Now? That's an intervention to stop a massacre. I'll be. I'll be. Uh, cleansing. Okay, so so the this, sixty-seven. Anyway, yeah, this is this is what I want. Uh, I think that. We spoke about history a lot. And if every great deal was ever rejected, is everything would ever happen does not justify what's going on right now. Hamas attack was horrible, did not justify killing the people now. So I want to talk about a little bit about right now. You know, Hamas, yes, because somebody rejected the deal, then people can, a lot of civilians and babies and stuff should be dying. Uh, that, that's not, shouldn't be it. So history... Those who are involved, they're going to be rejected. But you know, uh, no, right now. But, but but he but his position is that it doesn't matter what Hamas does. Israel has no right to defend itself, except perhaps to defend itself against people who come over the border. But that even if Hamas were to do it every single day, I, every day. So I, long I, I th- as Israel's think, not making a good faith effort to end the occupation. It, yes. It, it, yes. It, even occupiers don't have rights. I'm sorry. So, so, so they this, have is, this, is, this is what I want to so, say. Get so, out. So, so, so uh, hold on for a second. Get this out. Is, get get out, out of Gaza on the West Bank. Remove you, all the. Yes. Yeah. No, get out under what terms? Under a peace deal. But the peace deal that they proposed. In, first of all, Hamas no. doesn't accept the peace deal. So Hamas does okay. not represent the going peace. But they don't. Do you accept or not that Hamas has said we'd accept the state within 67? Th- there is one. There was one interview. Where there's, a few. W- there's there, one there interview in the San Francisco paper where the guy, uh, I forget his name, sorry, no offense, hot temp. <laughs> the guy, <laughs> names, uh, I forget his name, and he, and he said something about accepting the, the Saudi there's initiative. There's a lot more than one interview. And yeah. then they there's tried to confirm it with the other leadership, and they, got, they could get no response. And the, reporter but, fi- and the reporter finally concludes, you can look it up. So, so he, here's this. I'm not, the reporter finally concludes that they suspect that this might have been a way to prevent what seemed to be an imminent, an imminent Israeli reprisal. Other than that, no. I have it all here. No. They, so, so hold on. Right now, it's they do not. It's in the 2017 not, charter. Right now. It's in the 2017 charter. 
that they'd accept the so, state, yeah, yeah. With, this, that they'd accept the state within the occupied so, territories. So, so that's again, a tacit recognition of Israel. Again, it's if, not it's not a full recognition. It's not perfect, but it's better than the status quo. If, and it's better than Israel, which says, yeah, we'll accept a Palestinian state, but we'll only within the land that 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 will let them have, which is basically scraps. Right, but when okay? you're but when you're attacked for whatever reason, whether you're attacked because you signed a dumb. Uh, a dumb uh, mutual defense treaty for whatever reason you're attacked. No, I'm sorry. Uh, if Jordan's involvement in the 67 war doesn't justify Israel occupying for more than five decades and also not just attacking, well, I just read uh, you, also attacking I just, Lebanon too. I just read you all the- And killing tens and, and, and by the way, we didn't even get to Olmert who, who, offer, who, who wrote On that, an, yeah, okay. that the day he was going to withdraw from Jerusalem was the hardest day of his life. It was getting up, up, yeah, to, 90, up to 99%. Uh-huh. On so, a napkin, you know, you know what? He, you know, oh, let me tell you his, his, his his map was on a literal napkin, which he showed to which which Abbas showed, doesn't deny the map. Abbas 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 has, has it was has, on a napkin. It, That's it was a joke. Yes, it was, hold on no, a Abbas it has was, acknowledged it was the on map. A, it was on a napkin, and Abbas couldn't take it with him because he, he had to memorize what Omer put on a napkin. Memorize they, these people. They, they, they think it was that, literally on a napkin, and then Aaron, Omer was also Aaron, in a, come on now. He was a lame duck and indicted, and he was gone anyway. So the, that was a, that was a joke. The, the, I, I'm, that, not sure, I'm not sure of that timeline. It's true. I'm not sure if he was lame duck when this happened, but the I don't think he was lame duck when that happened. The, he was lame duck, and he was indicted. The the uh, he was indicted. Yes, the uh, Netanyahu is indicted. He's still in charge. The the um the differences between the Clinton map, which Abbas knew very well, and what Olmert drew on the napkin were slight. Two, two extra percent. Abbas didn't need the napkin to know what the differences were. I imagine, though I don't know this, Abbas didn't want to give the map because he didn't want it to be Ol leaked. Olmer didn't want to give the map. Uh, Olmer didn't want to, <laughs> sorry. Olmer didn't want to give the map because he didn't want it, didn't know where it would end up. So he said, initial it, and this is the basis for our negotiation. On a napkin. Abbas never complained about the napkin. Well, uh, Abbas you know, acknowledged Abbas is a the sellout to begin with. But anyway, all right. So, so you got to no, answer no, for everything. No, but no, but it's true. But, but you know, but, but, but the point is, it's not serious. Scrawling on a on a napkin is not a serious negotiation, and it's important for Palestinians because the map is everything. Because they're surrounded by these huge West Bank settlements, and Omer, I know this because this was in the New York Times. He wanted to keep big settlements like Ma, uh, Ma'el Abdumim, uh, which basically cuts the West Bank in half. And it also, does, put, bring and, the map up again. And also Ariel. Bring the map, bring the map up again. And also again. Ariel, which is, to, which is deep in the West Bank and very far from Israel. Nicole, you're going to bring it up again? You see anything cut in half there? Well, that's not a fair map then. That's the that's the, that's the uh, the napkin map. That's okay. Well, the one on the left. <laughs> okay. If, if, that, if, if that is a fair approximation. No one's disputed well, it. But, it's okay, been reported well, widely. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't it's see the napkin, West Bank cut in half. It's, it's a napkin drawing. Like you need something more precise than that. That's the whole point. It's no, pretty they, hard. It's pretty hard to be exact on a napkin. Can we that, agree that's, on that? That's my point. It's, the napkin okay. was irrelevant. What they, they discussed. Okay, well, put, they they just they know the keep, geography. It's like I said. It's like I said. Listen, I'm going to pull out from 104th okay. Street to 175th Street, then, and they and we and, do a map. Okay. We don't need the map. Okay. We understand what if, we're talking if, about. If you look at that map right there. That's supposed to be this tiny Palestinian state, and still, even that. And I'm not even saying that that map is accurate. Has these massive West Bank? Does that Bank look like 22% to you of the of the total? That does not look like that 22. is 22% of historic Palestine. That includes Jordan. It does not include Jordan. Well, then look <laughs> at that. Is that 22%? That is. 20%. You could fit five of those into that, the other. That plus Gaza is 22% of historic Palestine. Look at but that. It's not We're even looking that. at it ourselves. Is that 22%? Sorry, can I say something? Yeah. Go ahead. What do you mean historic Palestine? You might as well say the historic Middle East. It was a loosely defined region. T take the mic again. Part of which is. <laughs> has been defined as being in Jordan. It's a very loosely defined region. Why don't you say... There was how, how about call it... Dan, come, Dan, come on now. Come here. There, no, no, no. There was a... There you was, you there might as well say was, historic Holy Land. There was an entity... Historic Southern Levant. Historic... No. 
historic before uh, 1948. The Middle East. You're talking about a geographic before region with no 19... political implications. Okay, before with, a, 19... with a loosely defined no. border. No, okay, I'm sorry. Before 1948. I sent you, know, I sent you a definition for Botanic of, of Palestine. I texted you. Dan, what are you doing? Before 1948. He's talking about Dan. 22% of historic Palestine. Okay. Can I answer now? Which is a loosely defined no. geographical area okay. before of, of 19... no political import. Before 1948, there was a land called Palestine. They had currency. Curren and... Are you serious? Yes, I'm currency serious. was British minted currency. Dan, stop. Dan, stop. Come here. Okay. And it was defined as. It was Dan's defined as. It, it, it was defined British as Palestine. There was, there, were, there, there was a land called serious? Palestine. Yeah, I am so serious. I may be wrong about the Jordan. I just, but I, yeah, I, and there was something called Jordan, too. Dan, British stop. minted currency with Hebrew, Arabic, and English on it. I'm sorry. I think you should no, say no, he does. Israel's tried in good faith. But what I want to, I, yeah. I want to say two points because uh, I'm not saying it. All the so, Arab yeah. leaders said yeah. it. So, so, so I want to say two points. First is uh, the uh, what happened on October 7th. As I said, it should not be starting. Everybody say it's horrible. Uh, I send you a lot of uh, videos of the the biggest journalists and leaders in the Arabic world and Muslim world condemn it and everybody's against it and what happened against civilians is wrong but again you cannot start from the seventh why Hamas was created who gave them money who helped them being there who's negotiating with them right now who made them the spokesperson Hamas is worse for the Palestinian people just like they're bad for the Israeli so why keep them in power I said that over and over and over and everything is happening does not justify right now the killing of innocent people. There need to be ceasefire right now, and you need to stop, and you need to surrender and get Hamas, maybe the leader in Qatar. How about that? We spoke about that uh, a lot. Maybe, but right maybe now, the Sinai is part of historic Palestine. Something's not right. You, you should know. If, so, if so you're going to quote this again, stuff, you should know. I, again, it's true. Again, all this, you, can, you, you know, the history, the you know, rejection, Arafat, all these, everything is not justifying babies in the hospital dying this is the end of it so whatever happened in the past whoever is right whoever is wrong well then what should, matter. what should israel do right now first of all what should they have done on october 8th what should have done in october i told you before they should have surround gaza get the leaders of hamas from qatar which yeah, are they, they there they can't do that you can't make that happen well you can uh start through, a world war well you can you can go it from all the uh diplomatic uh, relationship until they get us can get them they have to surrender you go around that's just the leader Gaza, that, okay so, so and munich well, what the leader. Okay, let me ask you a question if america does something like, yeah let's say that and then uh the people that we do it to take your solution so they kill joe biden what happens no, I didn't say take the leader only. I said take the person that went on the video. I said, yeah, I planned this and did this. Right. Instead, taking people, innocent people in the hospital and stuff like that. What I'm saying is this is what you should have done. Well, yes, you have the right to defend yourself 100%. But against whom? This is the main thing. There's Palestinians and there is Gaza, there is Hamas. There's two different people, two different groups of people. And I send you videos over and over and over about how many people don't. Hamas is not, you know. It, By the way, I just found something else. Did you know? I didn't know this. Did you know that Al Shifa, Amnesty International, had reported on the fact that Al Shifa had been a Hamas uh, 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 base years ago? Well, five, I know that ago. Israel built a base underneath there a lot, uh, 40 no, years ago. Amnesty, Amnesty International. So I, I, I know that Israel built a base. We had first. we had a uh, uh, an international. And I also uh, know that today that Israel uh, hold on, came hold up on. with nothing. We, to we have an international law lawyer and crime wars. Uh, the, oh, uh, so last we should time, play that. And he said that. he said that if you play, if you put children, uh, if you go to a hospital, children, that's a war crime against Hamas. But if Israel attack it, it's also a war crime against Israel. So it's no, war crime no, for he both. Didn't say that you got yeah, he wrong. did. He did that. Well, let me, we have uh, it. I read this in Amnesty International. It's about Shiva. Hamas forces uses the, the abandoned. This is Amnesty International. This is what people like Finkelstein always throw at Israel. Hamas forces uses the abandoned areas of Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, including the outpatient clinics, to detain, interrogate, torture, and otherwise ill treat suspects, even as other parts of the hospital continue to function as a medical center. The report describes other cases in which Hamas forces abducted, tortured, assaulted perceived opponents, particularly members of the rival Fatah party, in some cases causing these, their deaths. These abuses, too, were committed with impunity. Many of the arrests looked like abductions with armed men in civilian clothes, sometimes masked, who did not present identification, forcing the suspects into a car. The suspects would be beaten in the car, and the beatings would continue at the place of detention and during the interrogation. In every case, Amnesty International has documented, it has uncovered evidence of Hamas forces using torture during interrogation with the apparent aim of extracting a confession. 
The testimonies indicate that the victims of torture were beaten with truncheons, gun butts, hoses, wires, and fists. Some were also burnt with fire, hot metal, or acid. In several cases, family members of the victims described to Amnesty International various injuries inflicted, strangling neck abductions, torture, and summary killings of Palestinians by Hamas forces during 2014 and 2015. On the detainees, such as broken bones, including of the spine and neck, bones, trauma to the eyes, as well as damage, punctures, and burns to the skin. They quote one, one son. My father had been tortured beyond belief. It was horrible. This was happening in the hospital. So, so, so this, his, is, like, this is Palestinian getting were, tortured, this, correct? This, his arms. And the point here is what? This justifies attacking a hospital now? No, the point here is that when, the, when Israel was accused of the earlier hospital bombing, mm-hmm. many people said, of course you believe it because they've done it in the past. Mm-hmm. And I'm asking you now, since you know that they've done it in the past, use the hospital, aren't you now beholden to say, yeah, I guess it is so, possible. So I want to tell you, t- course, say two things. I've, I've never said it's not possible huh? that they don't have a... Have, huh? Well, Amer- but, American, American Aaron, intelligence says... I wanna, I wanna, well, I, yeah, American intelligence says a lot of things. I want to say two things to American that point. said they're, they're, I, I want to say two that things. That Iraq had WMDs. And today, look, we're seeing the results. Israel has nothing. They went in there. There's no command center. Now they're even changing their story. They're saying, yeah, we found some tunnels under there. Uh, uh, can, you, can, you play, can you play Israeli, Hamas leader An Israeli interview? official uh, said... Show, show Hamas leader before, interview. An Israeli official said that actually, yeah, the whole point was to was this was a symbol to show that we can reach anywhere inside of Gaza. That's so, not all he said. Okay, that's, okay. A, that's what he said. This is a I have two, simple, yeah, two important points that I want to make. That's not fair. Quickly. I mean, uh, two, that, that's, that's, that's what he said. That, that was one little blurb on a readout. That's what he said. It was like it was They're like it was like a ticker. Now. They're but changing yeah, their story. He, and even if there was, listen. they asked him a question. Go ahead. That's ridiculous. Hold on. I, I need to say two That's things. That's ridiculous. Two things That's really, really, really important. One is it's shameful to attack. Is, the hospital. is just That's the fact that you said that Palestinians were tortured in this hospital and stuff like that. That shows us that Hamas. When we see elected and represented people, that's not right. But this is the important point, and I want you to ask you both that question. Everybody's listening. I want you to understand and think about the answer, and know that, and then you know the difference between the Palestinian life and Israeli life. If Hamas was hiding in an Israeli hospital, would they attack it? In an Israeli hospital, where there's Israeli babies, Israeli civilians, and Hamas is right there. Where they attack it, that leader, everybody that they want, they were inside they Israel. Attack, they didn't they haven't attacked the hot. No, the I'm the saying are still in my, the my question is this: We, att- uh, you know, Israel attacked a hospital. Say Hamas was there. What did what did Israel do to the hospital? They didn't blow up hospital. They didn't attack hospital. They so didn't blow if up the hospital. if if they Hamas shelled it, they so if wait, 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 so there's no which one? The, the earlier one. I'll sh- hold on. Hold. Just answer the I'll, question. Sure. If it hasn't been shelled. So if it? if there is a hospital uh, in Israel with raided. Israeli, I'll hold on. Has been bombed. If there is raided, raided. If there is. If there is Israeli hospital, would it even be raided? If it, if there's Israeli kids and children and babies, and uh, would it be and Hamas, everybody from Hamas inside? I think it's a great. Would point. they attack it? Yeah, of course Israel wouldn't, but because they don't because value Palestinian lives. That's that's they, that's, no that's sum it up. I think yeah. Israel life. This is I think this is the major thing. We need to think that all lives. Uh, it's I know. A, it's, it's, uh, I don't. I don't. Well, put that up, Nicole. I don't understand. Nicole like my point. Says, I, like, you I, know what? He I, wants this debate. I actually don't understand. It would, it would is okay. Uh, this let me read from the Times because this is important. I hope that the state of war with Israel, this, is, this was an interview with the Hamas leader. Can you move your head for sorry? I'm, I'm sorry. I hope that the state of war with Israel will become permanent on all the borders, on all the borders, and that the Arab world will stand with us. Tahir, how do you pronounce his name? Tahir? Where? Tahir El Nunu? Tahir El Nunu. Thank you. A Hamas media advisor told the Times Israeli airstrikes have reduced Palestinian neighbors to. Exp- Expanses of rubble while doctors treat screaming children in darkened darkened hospitals with no anesthesia. Across the Middle East, fear has spread over the possible outbreak of a broader region of war. But in the bloody arithmetic of Hamas's leader, the carnage is not the regrettable outcome of big miscalculation. Quite the opposite, they say. It is the necessary cost of a great accomplishment, the shattering of the status quo, and the opening of a new, more volatile chapter in their fight against Israel. Meaning, says to me, is that this is their intention. But this is, again, Hamas. But, but you agree not. it's their intention? Yes, this is Hamas. I Hamas. Send you, I send you videos of the Egyptian guy. He said Hamas built Do you agree not- it's their intention? Uh I think in some people in Hamas, yes, I do think that Hamas is not, it's not, a, mono- making the it's not a monolith. Well, Whoever is receiving the, the money, yes. The armed wing made a decision, I think, outside of the political leadership. But yes, there are people inside Hamas but, but who can, certainly do want Well, no, so, but if yeah. that's what they want, mm-hmm. then of course they're using human shields because how are they going to get it without it? Well, uh, okay. Uh, um, 
what do you mean by using human shield? I'm but saying there, there if, are people if, living if, in this if, densely packed concentration. Mean, can camp. you bring up the Gaza statistics? But, but, uh, but hold can you bring on. up the Gaza that stats? Mean, that means that Hamas do, does not represent the people. That means Hamas is the problem. So yes. why why did Netanyahu give them the money? Let, from, let's not from, let's, let's stretch over. We can talk. Uh, let's not jump. Okay, over. but you never answered my question. Can about you bring the up I don't understand it. I don't. I I literally don't understand it. Would Israel attack its own hospital? Yeah, if there is a hospital with children, Israeli babies and children, and everybody in Hamas inside, would Israel attack it? Israel, Israel offered to take all the patients out. Israel offered to take, brought, offered to take the the babies who were in incubators out, and they were turned down by whom? By Hamas? No, or, no, no. Yes, sorry. it's in it. You can you can't, no. Google no. it. Okay. Well, listen, the only I, thing that you know, said that after that that like we offered that we. But they we have, might, as far as I understand it, I hope I don't make a schmuck out of myself. They have not bombed. Al Shifa, they have raided Al Shifa. The patients what, are still there. What, they've, would you, shelled, they've shelled floors of it, and snipers attacked it, and they the, raided the, it. Today. The point, I, I, you know what? I don't, I don't want to say something that's yeah, incorrect. The, the point Nicole, is, that, I mean, this is please, unspeakable can you bring up the problem. Gaza population one, Nicole? You can just ask. Just, me. just for the record, they always talk about how how dense Gaza is. Do, do, do you mind uh, bringing the uh, children uh, percentage as well, please, in Gaza? We know we, we can stipulate it's, it's about fifty percent. We know this. I think a little bit more than that. Um, can you can you make it full screen? So, Gaza. This is Gaza population density is thirty six thousand. I'm going to round it off people per square mile. Manhattan is seventy two thousand, half that, double that. Manhattan during the day is a hundred and thirty thousand, so it's a uh, almost four times that. Gaza Strip in total is fourteen thousand, much less. New York City is twenty nine thousand, and by the way, CNN. I didn't. I could have Finkel. Okay, uh, I, wait, 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 wait. Who cares? I could have. I I could have. A la Finkelstein, just taken the the best statistic for me. But actually, okay. C, hold on, CNN. This justifies what? This proves what? I, I'm answering your. You you brought up the density. Yes, it's so very I'm, dense. Hold on, so, I have, so, a, I have so one. People so are going to die when you bomb it. CNN says that Jerusalem is more dense than Gaza City. Okay, and so, the point so, is. So no, I ask you. So. From from that overview, we all live in Manhattan. Yeah. We've all been in Jerusalem. How does the density figure into this? I'll, I'll tell you how. I'll tell you how. Are packed yeah. into a tiny strip of land. They're not you, packed into you, a tiny strip of land. Well, let me oh, explain okay, to so you how. How, how, you, how, how long would it take? How, how, how long? Drop two thousand pound bomb. How, how on tiny? Buildings. How tiny is Gaza? It's it's it is twenty five miles and then five miles across. It's as big as Manhattan. Uh huh. Plus Bronx. Okay, and can they just plus and so, so if it's somebody, as, it's as if, it's as far if away. If Hamas came and dropped two thousand bombs on New York City, it'd be okay because I know people who lived their whole lives uh-huh. and barely ever left Manhattan and the Bronx. Hold on, I want to be very clear. This is what I was afraid of. But what's the point? The life in Gaza is miserable. Yeah, but not for the reasons of density. It has nothing to do with the density. Okay, well, the, the density de- is a okay. is a background music. Cue the it's music. A fact. Density. It's just a fact. But, but yes, it's an irrelevant. The misery fact. comes from the blockade. The, the misery comes from other things. It, from the blockade. So occupation, never mention yes. the density again because the density. I, no, it's not, <laughs> it, I, I, it has unless you can unless you can illustrate to well, me well, I can, why the it density shows matters. how when I you can bomb tell. a place, civilians are going to die no matter no, what. No, hold on, please. On the contrary, if it's if they're really all packed in shoulder to shoulder, they are. And then, then to have because so few people dying requires very, very careful bombing. No, I'm, this is not careful because also you have two million people so many, there, shoulder to shoulder. How no, do you only kill? By the way, because also, by the way, the reason it's all, even more dense is because not how many every, civilians hold on died second, in Gaza? Hold, hold on a second. Not every building is inhabited because so many buildings have been destroyed in previous wow, Israeli yes, massacres. That doesn't make it denser. No, in but it previous makes it Israeli miserable. massacres, which means can, can you have generations of families le- living inside these little structures. Let me tell you how many civilians have died. In this current uh, round of Israeli uh, killings, yeah. well, the official toll, as, as we're speaking, I'm sure it's outdated now, is over eleven thousand civilians. So, well, the uh, health ministry does not distinguish. In why, its don't toll. They, why don't they distinguish? Uh, because they treat everyone as as equal, being a part of of Gaza, because they all live there. Do you really? But, you really, but really, you, you really buy that? If you look you, at you the really list, think that's the reason you're a journalist. You, you're a you, journalist. You believe that's the reason. Have you looked at the list? Answer me. You believe? Do that's, I be, like? Listen, you know that's not the these reason. Are, these are okay. Listen, Come on, are so, you a journalist or not? Are, are you trying to imply that they're trying to hide the real number of militants who are being killed? Is that what you're saying? Of course. Okay. They don't. Uh, they don't want to distinguish. Okay. Because of, okay. Uh, isn't well, that, when well, I look unless, at the list, unless okay. you have another reason, well, when it's I, definitely not because they're what I have is egalitarian. A fa- what I have is a fact: is the majority of people on that list are women and children, 
And so when I look at that list and you just look at it, you can go f- scroll for it forever until what, what you're... What percentage would you say are of civilians' deaths? You okay, well, I haven't we, done we have a forensic no, account. We have no idea. But what Does I've it seen, what I've seen is countless videos of babies, ah. infants, women and children, uh, men being slaughtered in their homes. Cause, and it makes sense because these are civilians that Israel is attacking. All right, let me, and and let Gaza me, can't fight back. Let me, let Listen, me tell I, you something. I am, I am, They're I am, a defenseless population I, I wanna, being slaughtered. I think this would be a good time to say something. 2,000-pound weapon. This uh, would be a good time to say something to you. On, on October 9th, Dan was here, or 10th, I said to Brett Stevens, if Israel did nothing to, re- to reprise as a reprisal here, I would not say... It, it was a bad idea. What's happening to the people of Gaza is, I and mean, we said at the beginning, but I, but I just want to emphasize it because it can get lost in this conversation. I do not mean to minimize. I mean, every day I think about it, what if it was my family? I, I get that. But like you want to correct the baby heads, and I respect that, I'm correcting the density stuff. It's the same thing. I'm saying, yes, I'm not saying... Some people, some people are saying the baby heads are actually saying it's a false flag. But many people are saying, listen, I'm not saying it's not terrible. What no, Hamas I don't understand did. your fixation with the density. Even if I'm Ga- saying even, that, even if Gaza had like the landmass of Canada, it wouldn't uh, justify killing all these civilians. That's fine. I, I didn't so, bring up the density. Well, hold, you did bring up the density. Ho- hold on, can I say something <laughs> about the, the density? density? Hold on, you're because, making an issue. Hold on, I'm, I'm, you know, when you compare Gaza to Manhattan, you know, or stuff like that, you understand that because of the air uh, laws, they cannot build a building more than five floors. Versus you have here, how big is that? So you can, how many families can you put in one building? It's not, it's not what you think. It's not like they have twenty floors building. It doesn't happen. We could go around and around with various cities yeah, that are comparable saying, to Gaza. But I'm saying it's just when 14, you say it's, it's, it's around, it's fifteen thousand people per mile okay. as opposed to Manhattan. Let's move on from the density. Let's move on from the density. Move the density now. Let's. Can we bring up this? Will be interesting. Can we bring up the Columbia professor international law? Because I I learned something from this. Is that um, from last episode? This is from, yeah. Um, I look so good. Um, Give me a second. All right. So, um, look. Can we talk about Dan's meltdown it's, for a second? It's, <laughs> it's, it's a war, and, and in my opinion, it, it can... I've said this all along. You don't know that. I'm not signing on the dotted line for what Israel is doing. I don't know. Nor will I rule out, because we've seen it on our own country, that... Um, certainly, so I, I, certain are you are you for s- certain soldiers may do things out of rage that will be a shame uh, on on the people. However, I don't see. I think respectfully, I, I think the notion that because it's an occup- occupying. Uh, uh, power that or blockading power, whatever you want to call it. I'm not trying to get cute, that Israel has to just sit and take it. Obviously, they don't. No, they don't. They can immediately end the occupation and engage in good faith negotiations. Yes, they can engage in good... They, they can say, you know what? We've been occupying these people for okay, 50 but, but people years. disagree about... Look, look we, we well, just... And that's, and that's what I will not compromise well, We disagree about what... Accept there's no legal then, standard of good faith. Point is that no... no Everybody has an obligation okay. to... If hold, Israeli, on. hold on a second. Let me get my okay, statement out. Point. Hold on a second. Let me get my statement out. But one more point, though. If Israeli leaders admit that the Oslo peace process was founded on a neo-colonial basis, if Yitak Rabin, who founded the Oslo peace uh, process said that he never wanted a Palestinian state. That's not good faith. It's not good faith. Okay. Barack certainly wanted it. When, when Barack, you can read about the history, Barack left dejected from the, yeah. the and Clinton left. Dejected. I have no sympathy for these and people. Arafat, it's their fault. And, and, and the Israeli people were dejected. Yeah, it's their fault. And Arafat was cheered. Yeah, he was cheered because he turned down a sellout they offer. Did, they, didn't the, know, they didn't know what he after he out. sold out his people. And they, and they began. Arafat is a sellout, but and, the and one to, good and, thing he did was turning down. And Camp to David. your point about the, the the potential for this to backfire, the pivotal event in modern Israeli history mm-hmm. was the second intifada, mm-hmm. which followed the end of the peace negotiations. Mm-hmm. Second Intifada, as I've said, was really just a slow-rolling version. It went on for a number of years, a slow-rolling version of the same atrocity that Hamas committed here. And it's 100% Israel's fault. Whatever it is, is I'm, yeah. I'm addressing your point about backfiring. Mm-hmm. You said that that is when Israel turned to the right. Yep. Well, even more to the right, yes. No, they, no. They, prior to that, you may be too young to understand, to, to know this. Prior to that, 100,000 yes. people turned out 
into Tel Aviv Square uh-huh. to support to support peace now. Yeah. So the country was completely different. I also lived through the Sadat chapter when mm-hmm. hardline Israelis and my father was one of them burst into tears when Sadat showed up at the Knesset because he showed them that he meant it. If Hamas were, and this is really where Finkelstein's argument truly fails in my opinion, is that if Hamas were to renounce violence and try to, and, and try to live in a different way and approach Israel and say, listen. Why can't Israel renounce violence? Israel, why do, why Israel do we will demand not Palestine, atta- Why do we demand Palestinians renounce violence, but not, but not Israel is occupying them? They if should. you're being occupied, why should you renounce violence? Now listen, and when they've tried, by the way, to be nonviolent, they get slaughtered. Like like the Great March of Return of Gaza in March 2018, which began then, a thousand Palestinians demonstrating in Gaza. They got they got, they got butchered. Nobody cared. When I was young, there were no checkpoints in the West Bank. The, all the checkpoints in or very maybe virtually none. Yes, every everything changed when suicide bombing started. No. Nope. Not true. No, no, that it, is true. It, they, I lived the, through it. The, I, I was, I the went checkpoints to began with basically— well, The checkpoints really began with the Oslo peace process, which was basically trying to use the PLO, who sold out their own people— But, but I'm going to grant you Dr. this. I'm going to grant you okay. this. It's much worse now, worse than it's ever been, because, sure. because of the high reproductive rates and the uh, outsized influence because of the Israeli system that the ultra-right religious people have. This is a terrible. This is where you and I will see eye to eye, uh, and and it's the inevitable result of trying to create an ethno state. It is. Uh, I want to ask you two questions Let's after this, this video. Play this. But Go I ahead. Play that, Nicole, something. if you don't yeah. mind. I'm just basically talk about uh, Michelle Paradis. Uh, illegitimate, and I'll define what that means because I'm a lawyer. Uh, but illegitimate targets or means of attack, and so illegitimate targets, the sort of the, the quintessential illegitimate target is what is technically called a non-combatant, but we would just call a civilian. Um, so if you are deliberately attempting to kill civilians, to target civilians, to destroy civilian homes, to destroy civilian infrastructure, to um, do anything else to civilians, then you are committing a war crime. Um, that does not mean that civilians and their property are immune from the dangers of war. Uh, that comes down to what's called a question of proportionality. And so that if the military is attempting to attack something that is a legitimate military target, Right, so a weapons depot, um, a uh, a barracks, a uh, military rallying point, something like that. The traditional sort of military targets. If you are targeting a military target, but there are civilians nearby, um, those civilian, you don't have to not target that military target simply because civilians will be hurt in the process. Um, that is euphemistically, and I think unfortunately, called collateral damage. Um, but what that ultimately gets down to is the the basic acceptance under international law that you know war is dangerous for all people and the job of a military a responsible military is to do their best to mitigate the dangers to civilians and so that comes down into what's called uh proportionality is the legal term for it and there the assessment is is the object is the military gain that we're going to have is this weapons cache is this barracks etc is destroying that does that outweigh the risk and to harm to people who are non-combatants, to civilians, that will result if we attack it? And that's an incredibly subjective judgment, to be perfectly frank. It's a very difficult judgment. It's a lot like asking whether or not this rock is as heavy as that rope is long, right? These are incommensurable questions, civilian lives versus military advantages. Um, I can tell you just from having worked in this space for a long time, Israel historically is actually pretty conservative. When it comes to civilian casualties and proportionalities, That's they have a, a lot joke. of process in place. As a joke, typically using um, military lawyers from the IDF to uh-huh. evaluate every target that's attacked. They use various. Um, they're, they're frankly much more conservative about civilian casualties than the United States is uh, in similar um, in, in similar particular uses of air power. Um, the Israelis take all sorts of precautions that the United States does not use, particularly something called. Um, called roof knocking, uh, where they'll drop essentially like a hand grenade on top of a roof that's of a building that's about to be bombed as kind of a warning to those inside to evacuate. So kind. And then they'll Once attack within an hour, essentially, after people have the opportunity to evacuate. So traditionally, Israelis, Israel and the IDF, the Israeli military, um, takes these proportionality questions really quite seriously and has a very careful um, 
at least process in place, whether or not you like the outcome of that process or think that's weighed accurately or, or justly is, I think, a different question. But to the extent that we're concerned about the law, uh, the IDF is is probably one of the most legalistic militaries in the world. Um, and they're supervised, the lawyers in the military are actually even supervised by civilian parts of the government, including the Ministry of Justice. So they're actually outside the military chain of command. So they have this very robust tradition of taking international law very seriously, whether again, whether or not, but historically, one of the things Israel does is after every strike, they have essentially a separate audit of the strike uh, by people who are essentially independent. Well, Okay, I can't account for whether that's yeah, correct I think or he's not. Full of shit. But he's Sorry. but he's not a particularly pro-Israel guy. Okay, I don't care what is uh, who a, he is. Full of shit is not an argument. I mean, okay, well, you know what he, we should he do. Has, Aaron? Uh, hold on a second. No, yeah, one sentence. Go ahead. He hasn't heard of the Dahia Doctrine. Okay, which was employed in Lebanon. It was described by IDF Commander Gadi Eisenkot as follows: We will wield disproportionate power against every village from which shots are fired on Israel and cause immense damage and destruction. From our perspective. These are military bases. This isn't a suggestion. This is a plan that has already been authorized. And that's what they did in Lebanon where they just destroyed big parts of it uh, because they couldn't defeat Hezbollah. So they took it out on the civilian population. That's what they've done their entire existence, okay, I can't, I can't, massacring civilians. So everything he said there is false. Okay, I can't, it's a joke. I, I can't gain, it's an apologetic you, for mass murder. I, I can't deny it or because I don't know I don't know what you're referring to. I'll, I'll have to research it. But why, we should probably, because we have to wrap it up soon, we should probably... Um, Identify, you know, how they say you're not entitled to your own facts, only your own opinions. We should try to get the same set of facts and then have a round two because it's not constructive if I say, you know, this happened. And because that's why I try to say, I, I tried to reduce things, let's take it for the sake of argument because mm -hmm. once we agree on what we agree on for the sake of argument, mm -hmm. then we get then we say, aha, well you said if and, and like like now, depending if I I believe you don't care what they find in the hospital. You think it's unjust because Israel has no business in there anyway. Well yes, but that let's is, presume that is let's, my opinion, but but let's but, presume you know, and I also know they haven't found anything in the hospital and what they put out is a joke. They've had to delete tweets They've um, they claim there was a command center. Now they're changing their story. By the time we meet again, we'll okay. know. Well, that we yep. nailed down. But if if Israel had the right, if this issue of occupation was not the issue, if this was just a a hostile country on Israel's mm -hmm. border, yeah, then am I reading you to say that you might support what Israel's doing now? Uh, well, you. Um, By but, the way, don't you support Russia? For similar no, grounds? No, I do not. No, okay. no I, I take that back. Okay. My argument on, based on Russia is Russia had to exhaust all diplomatic options to avoid that invasion. Okay, and, fair enough. And I think Russia made an effort, but I don't think they they've fully proven that they've made that, that they did everything they could to avoid uh, military conflict because they were in a position where their uh, you know their allies inside Ukraine were being attacked for eight years. And Ukraine, with U.S. support, was refusing to implement the Minsk Accords. You know what? I, I see this in you. I, you say they had to exhaust. Uh, diplomatic options it reminds me of they have to engage in good faith negotiations the problem is even if you exhaust diplomatic options or engage in good faith negotiations that's not a guarantee you'll come to a deal it's not a guarantee yeah. but at least you can show that you tried and then at that point if there are no options left then then you can say okay we have to use military force but by the way even, so, if, even if there were no i do not support tar uh, go massacring civilians as israel, israel is doing so even if it were attacked by, by but we don't really know how many civilians are being massacred it's we, a lot of civilians well, we, know, we know civilians are dying but it's every, a lot of civilians every we don't know if this is more or less than a typical this is what, a what, war this yeah, is a massacre this, uh, uh, yeah. hamas isn't uh, fi uh firing uh, like dropping bombs in israel they don't have an air force they don't, they don't even really have air defense they have nothing well, they built they built a city They're, but you you've said mm -hmm. that you believe that blood is their strategy here? I, so, in some so members you, of Hamas, yes. And yes. I think they're so, so if you I think believe they're criminally that, stupid, yes. Right, but if you believe that, then you at least have to discount what you're saying by the fact that is, that well, if that's their strategy, no matter what they're, then they're then they are getting Israel to do this. Yes. No. And, no. And, but Israel is still making the choice to do it. You Israel, can't have it both ways. No, yes, you can. Even though some people in Hamas might think it's to their benefit, Israel still has a responsibility yes. to obey the laws of war. They haven't. And, they have no. They, and actually, this is he said that in the in the show as well is. Is like the fact that um, you know Israel is supposed to hold itself not to Hamas. Listen, standard, I, I but think own I think we should all be charitable enough to say that if you're if you are in the U, pretty unique position as a as a country fighting a war, not a war, 
just allow me, how, fighting a war uh, with against a country whose goal is to have their civilians die. Not, not the country, Hamas. Whatever. A little militia force. If you're fighting a militia, concentration if camp. you are fighting, we were, I was taking for the sake of argument, presuming it was a hostile country on your border. Okay. Right. Uh-huh. Whatever it is, if you find yourself in a battle uh-huh. with a people who are in charge, whose goal is, which is unlike basically any war I've ever heard of, they're fighting a war with a, with a decision makers who want them to kill as many of their own people as possible. That is a pretty difficult position to be but, in no, but as a nation. But I tell, uh, I tell you, I tell you one thing: why this argument is not correct? Because you, you don't I, see any logic. What no, I no, I tell you why. I tell you, you why. See, you, but neither of you see any. No, no, I no, see. I, I, they're but, both I, the same. But let, listen, listen, That's listen, amazing listen, listen, listen. What I'm trying to say: whatever Israel is doing right now is not working. Am I wrong? I don't know if it's working or it's not I mean, working. Just look how be, many people just, are dying and how many, like, it's not, you could you're not be right. getting, I don't you, know if it'll work first or of won't all, work. First of all, the whole, war, you know, the what whole they were day, doing before wasn't working, was it? Well, definitely wasn't working when they were like allowing Hamas to get the money. But, you know, what no, I no, want to no, ask Let's put it this way. What Hamas is doing is not working. The uh, motives of actually, Hamas are irrelevant to yeah. the requirements of Israel. And it is but, no right to uh, bomb what, civilians. What, what, what they think? No matter what Hamas wants. Do they have a right to bomb military targets even if civilians get killed? No, they do not. Well, that's your incorrect. No, they do not. That's they, not they, that's they would. Not the they war. would if they were being actually being attacked, as was happening on October seventh. So we had no, no right, right to bomb Japan after Pearl Harbor. I don't to drop a, an atomic bomb. Absolutely not an atomic not. bomb. To yes, to, to yes, because that's a nation state. I'm, uh, so, yes, and, and, and so this all comes down. The U.S. To wasn't occupying Japan. But I asked. My question was There's to an you. Occupation. That, my that's question to you was: thing If Hamas it. was an independent nation, would you support yes. what Israel is doing? No, I would not support them massacring civilians as they're doing. Did, I, but, I would support them going after. Would military. you support us going to, going to Japan? Do you, uh, do you really well, think we they're, killed? They're do you wrong. really believe we killed fewer civilians in Japan than we're, than Israel's killing? In, in, I, I never said that. Well, but I'm saying, I, but then why I, would you support Japan? Okay, well, hold on a second. Why well, would you support all, retaliation it, in Japan? It, it, I don't want to debate World War II, but no, actually, we're, we're not World debating World War II. I'm making there, an analogy. There were that we alternatives all gonna... to the U.S. dropping an atomic bomb. I'm actually... not talking about okay. the atom bomb. Okay, I'm talking about if the retaliation. If the U.S. Before. is attacked by Japan, U.S. has every right to uh, strike Japan back. And and Israel. And if if Israel was attacked by, let's say, uh, I don't know, Jordan, right uh, now, Hamas. If, okay, if, Hamas, if Gaza no, is a separate be, country, because because in the moment when Hamas is attacking, Israel has a right to defend its civilians. Uh, after that operation is put down, which it was, Israel's no right to attack Dude, territory it's occupying. Fair enough. No, Dude, zilch. We are as close to, I mean, we're as close to as uh, Brooklyn as Israel is to Gaza. Japan was fucking on the other side of the world. Uh-huh, yeah. We felt Except we were, it was necessary for, and you support. The U.S. wasn't occupying Japan. Right, but I, we, we were taking it for the sake of... Aaron, I'm we, sorry. We you, were you taking. To, we were having conversation. We were, that's my argument. We had accepted the for the sake. We had accepted for the sake of argument uh-huh. that Gaza was a separate country. That there was no occupation. I okay. Was, I was asking sure. you. In that if, case, fine. Yes. So it, Israel, you would yes. support Israel if not for the occupation. I would support their right to obey the laws of war, which they're not doing. Yes, but they would have the right to self defense. Yes, they would. And they would, including killing civilians, in, in by trying to get the tunnels. If if laws of war allow, I mean, I don't. Of course, laws of war, laws okay, of war attack allow for some quote unquote collateral damage. Yes, but this isn't collateral damage. This is a massacre. You think they're targeting civilians? Yes, I Do you have any I, evidence for that. Well, I don't, I'm not in the control room. But you're but a journalist. They, you're saying if, it. If Israel repeatedly, you're a journalist, and you're saying it. Yes, I am saying it. Based on I, what? Based on the preponderance of dead bodies who are piling up every single day in a country of two million people. Piled on top of each other. It's yeah. pretty few bodies for indiscriminate bombing, isn't it? Well, it's how, it's, how do you target civilians that only kill ten thousand in total, including the well, terrorists? The official toll is eleven thousand. Eleven thousand. How do you how do you bomb? We're not we, bo- we dropped more bombs on on Gaza we're than not, we dropped in Afghanistan. Uh, Israel dropped more bombs. Not we. <laughs> <laughs> Israel, Israel dropped more bombs in Gaza than we dropped in Afghanistan. We've killed eleven thousand people. Counting, some percentage of those okay. civilians. We're not counting the, in a pop in the densest place yeah. there is. We're not counting the people buried. And you the think ro- they're targeting civilians? Absolutely. And they're I, terrible targets. I think if Israel was targeting civilians, there'd be hundreds of thousands okay. of dead. No, talk now. We're not counting the people under the rubble. First of all, second of all, Israel has bombed uh, uh, power infrastructure, power plants, uh, sewage plants. That's going after the civilian population, trying to make oh, their life miserable. So well, it is. They're trying to inflict damage on the civilian damage? population, which they've always done. And yes, you're changing the subject. I, I'm sure in the targeting room they say to themselves, "Okay, yeah, here there might be a Hamas militant on in the Jabalia uh, refugee camp. There's one guy. Yes, there's all these other think civilians it's there." I think it's it's evil, and everybody signs it's off, on it, including the lawyers. They say it's okay. Yes, wink, wink. We can, yes. we can. And and the U.S. is, you know, you the, think they they just want to kill Arabs? 
Yes, and, and they say it. These Israeli officials talking about let's cu- let's cause a second Nakba. These people are human animals. There's no distinction between civilians and Hamas. This is this is stuff they've all said. G- it's from their mouth. Gideon I mean, these Levy. Are sadistic monsters. Gideon Levy used the term human animals. He described. But he was talking okay. About, well, that's Gideon. He Levy. He was talking about Hamas. Okay. Uh, 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 Gallant had two quotes. One time, one time he said we're fighting animals, and one time he said we're fighting animals. Hamas. There are outrageously disgusting people out there like we have in our country, like we certainly have in, in other countries who say horrible things. I could play you now 20 minutes of Arab leaders saying the most disgusting things. I could play you just from a few months ago when Abbas said that Hitler killed the Jews because, of, uh, because they were you know, charging interest. Yeah. You, we can cherry- Abbas doesn't have, a, have one of the most powerful armies in the world. So I don't care, you know. Sure. We can, like what we can cherry pick a quote here and there of okay, somebody who says something Israel, to be ashamed. But Israel has weapons to actually make their genocide uh, out of rhetoric. Right, we have so, to so, reality. Yeah, yeah, I have two questions before we go quickly, and then we can and go. We're going to go our facts, and we'll do it again. And but all right, want, for, for, want. for for both. And uh, no fair. He's been, he's been getting outside uh, help. <laughs> That's not true. Yeah, I, I don't I've, lie. Been, I've been using Google. <laughs> I've been using Google. I would have given you my laptop. I'd love to have outside help. You can take laptop. I'll bring it next time. Yeah, I'll provide you. Well, let's do around. I wish I'd known you wanted to talk about 1967. I would. Yeah. Well, I guarantee you. Well, you tweeted about it yesterday. I guarantee you the next time we're not yeah, going to talk about war. 1997 and we're going to talk about right now. But here's the, the two things for you, Norm, uh, questions. Okay, okay I'm gonna, I promise I will let you do it. Sure. But it's funny you say that because I- in the end, your whole argument actually rests on 1967 because you see the occupation as the the it, probably the critical difference in what Israel is doing and what they could do. And that all comes down to 67. So 67 plus the ethnic cleansing of 48. Right, so, yeah. so the... Well, that's the, that's not that's not the occupation. You you think the that's occupa- the cleansing, yes. Yeah, but you think the occupation is of paramount legal absolutely matter. So yes. so that comes yes. down to sixty seven. And if Israel might, if one were to argue that Israel was the victim in sixty seven rather than the aggressor, if you wanted to apologize for them taking over territory, yes, you would say that. Then yes. it, it so it is. And well, even if they were the victim, why do they still have that land? We're talking right, about. Well, I'm just saying that six years ago. No, all I'm saying is that when you said I know we talked about sixty seven, I'm like, well, sixty seven is actually at the heart of your argument. Okay, That's yes, it is. So, right. but we're yeah. gonna have to resolve the issue yeah. of whose forces yeah. were on the Egyptian border first, which we'll do next. Yeah, time. but but okay. it still wouldn't justify Israel holding on to I, that. I, I bought so many books on this. I'm gonna lend them all to you. I'm gonna give you my. Okay, Amazon and I'm gonna give you the. Uh, I won't the, read it. The, the Iron Wall, but he's <laughs> okay, Israeli. He's a prom Israeli. Yeah, just guys, when you CC each other in email, don't CC me. So, so you know, again, everything that's happening, you know, in the past or whatever, yeah. even if it's the worst people ever, does not justify what's going on now. Two questions for you quickly. Yes. One, I haven't heard you anything uh, saying anything about Israeli responsibility for leaving Hamas, giving them power, all that. There's no blame at all at that part because obviously Hamas caused this for the Palestinian and Israeli. It's almost like it's their own interest to so keep I did Hamas. A- and the other th- question, so you can answer both, yeah. are you for ceasefire or no? Because I think right now nothing is working. Okay, so question one: I did an interview the other day with a guy named uh, Spire. I think his name Jonathan Spire, who um, has written a lot about this Netanyahu uh, quote. It's, it's not a confirmed quote, but um, I don't, I don't doubt he said something said something like that. Um, and this whole issue of Hamas propping up uh, about uh, Jesus Christ, I can't even focus. <laughs> of Netanyahu propping up Gaza, uh, propping up Hamas. Um, is very complex. He was criticized both from the left and the right in Israel for it for different reasons. Um, the idea of giving money to a hostile power to keep them calm is a strategy kind of like the Iran deal. You know, it's a strategy which, which left-wing people often imagine. The idea of Netanyahu doing it to avoid a two-state solution is also certainly possible that Netanyahu wants to avoid a two-state solution forever. It's possible that Netanyahu is so skeptical of any chances for a two-state solution, given given what his read is on the Arab world and his quotes about him on this, that he doesn't want to get sucked into that and he thinks it's better. Or there's another option that he was just wants to prop up Prop up. He wanted to give money to Hamas to keep them calm and was justifying it to his far right base in terms of throwing them red meat. In other words, saying, listen, are you really going to oppose me on this? Don't you know you never want a two state solution? Don't you know you'll never have a two state solution so long as Hamas is there? 
So where the truth lies on that, to be perfectly honest, I have no idea. I had John Putt Horitzen here years ago, and I asked him, because he kind of, I think... But just the fact that he allowed Hamas to exist there, knowing well, I, everything if, that you if, bring well, down... Well, he can't stop Hamas from existing because yeah, he, they're... This is know, what it looks like to stop Hamas from existing. Yeah, and also, but it is true that from Hamas's inception, but Israel, he can, Israel recognized that propping up Hamas would undermine the PLO and undermine their calls for a Palestinian state. So well, there is no a, PLO anymore, but why well, don't you? But what I'm saying is from the start of Hamas, which is 1988, yeah, yeah, right. Israel adopted a strategy of Having propping up each other. Yeah. Was, I, listen, I've been talking for four hours. Yeah, okay, what, last, what was the second question? Ceasefire. Because I think, as I said, right now, nothing is working, and this is bad for I everybody. take the Bernie Sanders position. No ceasefire. No, I think that I think anything anything for humanitarian reasons, Yeah. Um, why would I not support that? Um I don't know to what extent humanitarian pauses are still needed, but and and more so now that Israel is in charge. They say the North uh, Gaza's collapsed in the North. Now that Israel's supposedly in charge of the North, I think Israel should uh, Im- immediately let out the stops on uh, on help for for these poor suffering people. A ceasefire, meaning what? And then to negotiate with Hamas for what? Hamas has to go. You're, you're speaking out of both sides of your mouth. At one side, you're saying. Why should they, Hamas should have never been there to begin with? And now you're saying we should have a ceasefire, which means Hamas will stay. Well, a ceasefire really means there's one side is really firing. But the if it's cease, a ceasefire, it means Hamas will stay. Yeah. No. But you just finished telling us no. that Hamas should go. Well, you the, all Hamas the, is not going to go voluntarily. No, I know they should go. How are they going to go? Well, Munich style. I said that before. How is Hamas going to go? They're going to go through a war Hamas. or whatever, a military action, whatever you want to call it. Well, uh, you're speaking. You're literally speaking no, on no, both no, sides no. of your mouth. No, no, I'm not. First of all, all ceasefire right. meaning all the fire. One side have a lot of fire that firing. One side, we see the damage here. We see the damage. What happens Come after on. ceasefire? Come How on, does Hamas go. Uh, the- Israel has to go too because Israel. <laughs> yes, because Israel, Israel's the occupying power. So <laughs> Israel's got to go. What has to happen is the occupation gotta, has to finish up. The occupation has to end. Uh, first of all, there has to be uh, a negotiation over release of hostages, captives, uh, free all the civilians who are being held by Hamas. For all the civilians who are being held by uh, Israel. Aaron, and- I'm going to give you the last word to make a like a three-minute thing, whatever you want to say, without interrupting you, because I interrupted you a lot. So go ahead. Okay. Well, thank, thanks, Roman. Listen. Nicole, th- are we off air? Okay. I'm no, just, just joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, they don't know him too I'm well. not going to take three minutes. <laughs> I, I appreciate being here. It's been a good discussion. The fundamental problem to me is the occupation. Occupiers don't have the right to defend themselves. They have the right, the obligation to end their occupation. And this is a massacre, and it needs to stop now. And it could stop if the U.S. changed its position. Rather than apologizing for Israel, rather than abetting it, rather than arming it, Joe Biden could use the huge leverage that the U.S. has over Israel and demand that it stop. And then from there, demand that Israel give up its occupation. And as for Hamas, um, I'm sure they, the leadership would be happy to negotiate their way into exile um, if that would ever be uh, possible. But regardless, I'm not concerned with my fundamental problem is not with how people resist occupation. It's on how occupiers act. And this occupier Israel has to stop. They're a danger to themselves. They're a danger to everybody else. They're, uh, the biggest threat to Israel's long-term security is Israel itself and its expansionist uh, occupation. And until they, ref- until they give that up, they're going to face more death and destruction for themselves and for everybody else. And uh, it has to end. And um, already you're asking Palestinians to accept a major compromise in 22% of their land, which some Palestinians have accepted, some haven't. But the minimum Israel could could do is accept that compromise because, by the way, it's also what the rest of the world supports. The, the world consensus is a two-state solution on the 1967 borders. That's what the Arab states have offered Israel. That's what Iran endorsed. That's what Hamas even once endorsed. That could still be possibly revived. And even that would be unjust because you would still perpetuate this ethno supremacist state where Jews have more rights than everybody else. And that's not something I believe in. But to me, that's the compromise position to allow that. Would you make any allowances to Israel for security, given the fact that jihadi groups? Yeah, they'd have security there? guarantees. Yeah, that, that would have to be part of any treaty. Guarantees. But, but, but like yeah. recognizing their, recognizing their board. Israel doesn't recognize its own borders. The problem is Israel. You know, like Netanyahu said that we we lay claim to the land of all of all of Israel, like yeah. which he means is the West Bank yeah. and Gaza. So Israel has to recognize its own borders, which is the borders the world recognizes, yeah. not the occupied territories. 
and then from there it can have true Aaron, security. I, I have some common ground with you, but there is there's there's just we have to end. But there, there there's two problems. One is that jihad. People like Iran. Do you think if the worst wait, jihadists are intelligent? I can't believe I didn't ask you this earlier. If Hamas had had a dirty bomb, do you think they would have used it against Israel? Yeah. What's the point of this hypothetical? Well, the point of the hypothetical is that so long as Iran exists and is developing nuclear— They're not developing, de- they're not developing nuclear weapons. No, and they're developing nuclear materials. Yeah. You don't need a nuclear, you don't need a nuclear bomb to have a dirty bomb. Uh-huh. And, they're, and as so long as the jihadi fever exists in the world— What about the Zionist fever? Uh, fair enough. So long as that exists, any deal that Israel makes with a leader— a dictator, these are dictators, is only worth the piece of paper that it's written on because if he's assassinated tomorrow and Hamas takes over, then everything resets except now Israel is this narrow. And now, Israel now, you, have, now you have a sovereign nation. Oh, come on. A so- no. Hold on. Now you have a sovereign nation uh-huh. allied with Iran who's developing n- nuclear-, nuclear energy and with the capacity possibly, if yeah. they kept going, for nuclear weapon, which they don't have now. Okay. Well, uh, listen, jihad. You you recognize that jihad has killed hundreds of thousands of people in the Arab world over the last ten years, maybe a million. Well, people. yeah, with the support of us and the also of us. and also Israel. But too. I'm saying so. Israel so, supported jihad in Syria. But 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 I'm saying that they still have the appetite uh-huh. for. Uh, I think it's a million deaths. What did Sam have? Fifty thousand terrorist attacks, something crazy like that over the last ten years. Okay, and in, we, in, in the Arab world, and we this, did the Iraq this, War, which killed so, over a million people. At, so, at some, no, we did Libya, we didn't did kill Syria. Over a people in the Iraq War, but at some point, at some point, I'm just wondering if you understand that, no matter how firmly you believe that the history of Israel is one of oppression and uh, conquest, I'm going to put it. Uh huh. No matter how Israel got here. Israel's enemies are dangerous to it, and Israel is dangerous. You, to you can't enemies. actually expect them to just put their head on uh, a guillotine uh, and hope that. Okay, we have to go. Israel, hold on, hold on. Israel bombs Syria. Let, let, Israel's invaded Lebanon. Okay, we have to go. Israel's yes, a threat. Yes, let, let, me, Israel's a threat. let me end thirty seconds, and then we're going to end one. Go. Stop making jihadis by killing all these people that they become jihadis. You know, so that's the. I, I think that, jihad existed before uh, because there always were. We created. Existed. We created Bin Laden. Yes, he did actually. Israel. Yeah, not Israel. The not United Israel. States. But uh, anything. Anyway, life in America. This is the best thing I like about debate. Nobody ever say, "Yeah, you're right." Doesn't happen. <laughs> he, he said so, I was right. <laughs> so uh, maybe maybe <laughs> round two. Aaron soon. said I was right. I heard. Live from America <laughs> podcast. Thank you. <laughs>